that, uh, again, uh, we're going to talk about what we can really do. And we're also going to get uh, our, our special guest is Dr. Wong. Uh, he's a cardiologist as well. You can see cardiologists are interested in uh, weight management. He's going to tell you about the, the BRAVE project. And we're going to talk about best strategies. So I'm pretty excited about what we have today uh, to talk about. If we can have the next slide, that would be fantastic. And uh, if we can back up one slide. So this is why I'm really nervous. So I want you to meet Gre uh, Greta, and, and everybody sees Greta's every day. And this lady was in my office the other day. She's had bypass surgery, she has sleep apnea, she has diabetes, congestive heart failure, arthritis, anemia, GI reflux, depressed, hypertension. She's had heart attacks, high cholesterol, renal insufficiency, and she doesn't have that many friends. And she's been working hard at her weight. And after six steps, she short breaks. And, um, and she's been working hard at how to, to lose weight. Now, my first question to everybody is that uh, the vast majority of the people that I see aren't willing to put the time and effort to be healthy. And uh, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. Uh, but you know what? I'm, hey, Stuart, how much do you think I weigh? Um, you're 100. You'll have to remind me, what, how much was it last week? Yeah, so last week I was at 171. Okay. And, and uh, I even took a dose of a Zepic, a couple mm -hmm. doses we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and I really exercised hard. I would climb the steps last night. Okay. I played tennis a few times this week. And today on the scale, I am? 170. 172. I gained a pound ah. this week, <laughs> and, I, and I'm not mad at myself. My magic is still 165. I'm I'm really working at it, and mm. um, I'm having a good time trying. And what I want to encourage everybody is how to work at trying harder and differently, and not being hard on yourself. And I'm going to get there. I'm I'm already down to about 20 pounds. I still have that magic six to get to, and I'm going to get there. Um, but really, what worries me is the, the greetas in the world that our lives are very challenging, very difficult, and we're dying from complications of congestive heart failure. All these problems that we're seeing right now are related in part to weight. And uh, we have to find a better way because since our start of practice is that diabetes is tripled, uh, extreme overweight has probably gone up 400-fold. I'm not quite sure. It just seems like and we actually look at that, is that 80% of people who walk through my office are overweight. Um, and I'm overweight, and I'm still working at it. So we're going to get that way, and we're going to talk about some strategies. So this is sad when this happens, and we're going to find ways how to, how to move forward and how to get better. So um, uh, George Wong is going to talk about a project, and I, I think this lady will be your first patient that we're going to randomize into your trial called the BRAVE trial, but we'll, we'll hear about that a little bit later. Um, next slide. She has a body mass index of 44, and we'll, we'll show you what that means in, in a little while. Now, but if we backtrack one slide, we have nothing to worry about, uh, because here's Trudeau says, Greta, I feel your pain. I will help you lose weight. Every Canadian should have resources to lose weight. But, you know, Puta says, you know, um, it's okay, Russia, nobody's overweight, and we have the first anti-obesity vaccine. And here's Trump. He says, yeah, Greta, you're not fat. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit overweight. It's the sign of being rich. Besides, I have beautiful and I have perfect hair. So here's the people in charge. Um, so we have nothing to worry about. So my answer is we have a lot to worry about. And, and if, if you're going to look for somebody else to solve your problem, good luck. We talk about um, being empowerment, and we're going to empower you and learn better ways of doing this. Next slide, please. And that's just a joke about a politician, or maybe not. Now, you've seen this picture of how to improve quality of life, and one of the things that Emily's going to talk about, is, and Zoya as well, is how do we get better resilience? How do we get that pillar of being in a good psychological frame? Look, I'm stuck at my weight. I'm not mad. I'm just working harder. Because if you look at people that are overweight, we have lots of inflammation. We see all the consequences. You saw Rita there, and she was really in big trouble. And we, how, do we get, how do we move forward from this? Next slide, please. Because... What I'm saying, if as a cardiologist, the heart gets weak and the heart gets stiff and congestive heart failure with all sorts of medical problems associated with inflammation, 
is probably how most people are going to die. At one time, uh, diabetes, you died from a heart attack or from blindness. Now, we make you live longer, you die from heart failure. With, with patients with heart disease, we, we bypass arteries, we treat your cholesterol, we prevent heart attacks, but the heart gets weak and stiff. You die of heart failure. In fact, next slide, please, is that you can actually measure um, different parameters. Well, next slide, if you get a chance there, please. It is that we can have, these are scoring systems for developing heart failure, and on your left, you'll see that just being overweight, high blood pressure, getting old, you're going to develop heart failure if you're not careful. So treat blood pressure well. Um, don't age. Um, so you can use the, 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 the Russian vaccine about anti-obesity and anti-aging, or you can join the human race and, and find different ways. We have different ways of measuring it. You can measure it very well with our echoes and our blood tests, as you can see here. So these are some, some clues. But more importantly, probably the best tool that you can have is a blood pressure machine and a scale. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring my weight on a regular basis every day or most days. And I use weight not to get mad at myself, but use to gauge my progress. So, so to me is that you can decide how often you want to weigh yourself. I'm at a phase right now where I'm weighing myself almost every day. And I'm, I'm not getting mad. I'm just using it as a barometer how to make good progress. Next slide, please. You see... Doctors are saddened because if you're an eye doctor, you're seeing blindness. If you're a psychiatrist, you're seeing depression. If you're a cardiologist, you're seeing congestive heart failure. And these are the many facets of how your weight's affecting your health. If you're a surgeon, you're cutting off pieces of limb. Uh, you're cutting out cancer. If you're a kidney doctor, you're doing dialysis, you know. Um, and uh, so, you know... And the poor family doctor sees a little bit of everything. So every doctor and every one of us know the consequence of being overweight. And now we call this a chronic medical problem. It's been a chronic medical problem for years. Um, and we have to find some solutions and, and uh, some better ways of treatment. So to me is that I'm going to show you some good ways of getting to come up to fight and to, to, to fight better. Next slide, please. And... Um, I always want to start off with, with young people. Um, uh, this is Teresa. Teresa is one of our McMaster students. And next slide, please. Is that uh, she and many have been wonderful additions to our team. She has a good, strong heart. And uh, she wants to keep it that way. Now, one thing I was really kind of surprised. Teresa and I went for a walk after clinic. It was around 10 o'clock uh, last night. We went to the Shadok stairs. We're going back there tonight. But... Um, she stopped after three sets of stairs. And I'm, I'm um, three times her age. I can go a little bit longer, a lot longer. So I'm going to get everybody in better shape um, and uh, get better. But, uh, you know, there's so many ways of getting healthier. And, uh, and uh, uh, young people have taught us a lot. And that's because we can do these webinars because of people like uh, Teresa and others as well. So I just want to thank her and everybody else for their, their participation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be quiet for just a little bit, and I let the team uh, tell us a little bit about uh, weight and what to do next. Okay, so we'll start off with a little bit of obesity, um, you know, the link between obesity as well as how it relates to cardiovascular disease. Um, so what exactly is obesity? It is a treatable disease, but it's basically when you do have excess amount of body fat. Um, it can be caused by both your genetic factors as well as environmental factors. And it can be difficult uh, to control just through diet alone. You need a lot of different things. You need physical activity. You need, um, you know, help from others like your doctor, your physician. Um, and obesity is diagnosed by a healthcare provider and it's classified in, you know, different categories. And these categories are based on BMI, also known as the body mass index which basically measures the weight that is related to the height. So it's going to be measured as kilograms per meter squared. Um, these classes are identified as underweight, healthy weight, overweight, obesity, and severe obesity. And um, obesity is classified when the person's weight is an unhealthy range, range of BMI of about 30 to 39.9, um, and it leads to many health problems, especially cardiovascular diseases. You can also measure the waist circumference, which is basically measured by positioning the measuring tape um, at the hip bone below your belly button and around the hip bone. The waist measurement of greater than 102 centimeters for males and greater than 88 centimeters for women 
is associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Um, next slide, please. So, so, sure, so, so the classification of bingo, right, there's different classifications, but the two best ones we think of is body mass index, uh, best body mass index 20 to 25, and the higher you go, the higher your, your risk is. And yes, you, there are nothing's perfect because you have lots of muscle, it, it can be an issue. Um, but body mass index is really a, a, a good parameter that's measurable in waist circumference as well. So those are probably the two best measurements uh, we have clinically. Um, and you're looking at certain types of fat tissue. The best fat tissue that predicts risk of heart attacks and strokes are the ones around the belly. And that's why waist circumference is being an issue. Weight or extra weight around the hips are not a good thing, but it's um, it's better. It's not as unhealthy. Is it's a more it's more of a cosmetic issue where waste uh, fat is a measure of increase in uh, inflammation and it kills you from cancers to heart disease to stroke to Alzheimer's disease, dementia, etc. So um, we're going to learn about how you measure your waist circumference. So go ahead. This is just going to play the video. Thank you. So again, there's different measurements. I always do my standing, and um, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, wait, 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 get to get their weight and get and get your body mass index and get your waist circumference. Great. Next slide. Okay. So the impacts of cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, there have been many advances in the care of patients, but the uh, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease, the complications of it, still remain high. Um, it is the number one cause of mortality worldwide, and it's the second le leading cause of death in Canada. Um, about 1 in 12 or 2.4 million Canadians adults aged from 20 and over live with cardiovascular diseases, and 12 Canadian adults um, aged 20 and over diagnosed with cardiovascular disease die every hour. So the most common types of cardiovascular diseases are ischemia, um, ischemic heart disease, which does lead to heart attacks. Um, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and heart failures. Um, next slide, please. So why does obesity contribute to the heart disease? Um, obesity basically contributes to heart disease because it leads to the changes in your cholesterol levels. Um, and basically what happens is that obesity causes um, and rise in your bad cholesterol levels as well as your triglyceride levels. And it can also cause a rise in your blood pressure. So, you know, when you're obese, it requires um, a greater amount of blood to be, to be supplied because you, you need a greater amount of oxygen and nutrients in the body. And this then causes an increase in your blood pressure. The body will also require um, extra pressure to move this blood around. And this high amount of high blood pressure is a common cause of heart attacks, which is sadly common in obese individuals. Um, this also all leads to increased amount of uh, risk of diabetes, where individuals with diabetes are said to have about two to four times more likely risk of getting a heart disease. And, you know, these conditions all, again, increase the risk of coronary heart disease, your stroke, sleep apnea, COVID-19, um, produces low quality of life, uh, depression, and increases the causes of death. So it's kind of interesting, you mentioned cholesterol and blood pressure. Those are effects of being overweight, but also increases inflammation, and inflammation causes atherosclerosis. It decreases you know, depression, sleep apnea. It's a lot of bad things. I'm trying to think of a good thing about being overweight. I mean, the only thing I can think about, if there's a famine, it's a good thing. But for the rest of us, it just causes a lot of, uh, lot of medical issues, uh, as well as psychological issues. So... Uh, 
Thank you for sharing that. No problem. Next slide. Um, so basically, an increase in body fat can directly contribute to any type of heart disease because it increases your, you know, atria. It uh, causes ventricular enlargement. It also causes arteriosclerosis. Um, and furthermore, you know, the body fat indirectly contributes to heart disease to the promotion of, like I said, sleep apnea um, and worsening metabolic diseases. Um, so basically, individuals that are considered metabolically healthy obese um, are those that are obese, but they don't suffer any metabolic abnormalities, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. And these individuals themselves have actually an increased risk of cardiovascular disease events compared to someone who's normal weight and um, suffers metabolic abnormalities. Um, so these results show that, you know, those who have um, metabolically healthy obese um, have a 49% higher risk of getting coronary heart disease. They're 7% at a higher risk of getting cerebrovascular diseases um, and a 96% increased risk of heart failure than a normal weight, um, a metabolically healthy individual. The risk of heart failure due to obesity is about 10.9% in men and 13.9% in women. And even just a five unit increase in your BMI is associated to at least 41% increase in the risk of, you know, any type of heart failure. So BMI is, each unit of BMI increase does significantly um, cause, uh, increase your chance of getting a cardiovascular um, disease. Next slide. Okay, so now we'll just be talking about how weight loss does, um, does help uh, cardiovascular disease. Next slide. So basically weight loss um, lowers your chances of cardiovascular disease events and total mortality. It uh, reduces your total mortality by about 16% in obese people with risk factors, including, you know, type 2 diabetes. So people with type 2 diabetes who lose only at least about 10% of their initial body weight reduce their cardiovascular disease endpoints by about 21%, um, while the effect is much greater with the greater weight loss, and you know, it, which is obviously induced by bariatric surgery, which we will talk about later, um, by about 32%. And um, patients who lost about 5 to 10% with the, had significant reductions in their total amount of triglycerides, their total cholesterol levels, and their bad cholesterol levels, or LDL. Um, patients who lose greater than 10% have greater improvements in triglycerides and total cholesterol levels. So, you know, there is no doubt that a, losing even just 5 to 10% of your body weight can help you reduce the risk of getting a future heart attack or stroke. And this all does occur because losing weight reduces your heart's workload. You know, your blood vessels supply the heart with blood, so it needs to keep pumping. And if you do, you know, lose a couple of pounds, the, the fat that is present in um, the arteries, it forms plaque. So basically by reducing that, that fat that is present, you're reducing the amount of plaque that can be formed, which then prevents or decreases your chances of getting a heart attack. Um, and reducing your weight also reduces the, uh, the risk of uh, fatty blood, um, blood lipids in your blood bloodstream from changing, um, from changing or causing any sort of cardiovascular disease. Weight loss can also make your triglycerides go down, your LDL cholesterol goes down, and your HDL, which is the good cholesterol, goes up. And that means good cholesterol is present more and bad cholesterol is less. And so, you know, you have a much, much better bloodstream. And some of the blood also slows down and can form clots. So by having a healthy weight and lowering your blood pressure can also mean fewer blood clots present. And this can then, um, you know, help you from preventing any, any future heart attacks or any other cardiovascular diseases. That's a good point, actually, because, you know, is that as you gain weight, your blood thickens and it actually causes more clotting abnormalities, so more blood clots in the lungs, the legs. The other thing, too, is it also brings up a different fat called triglyceride uh, that thickens the blood, too, and leads to uh, digestive problems such as pancreatitis, heart disease, and stroke, and cancers as well. So, man, oh, man, you can see how weight is uh, a central role to, to many health problems. Awesome. Next slide. Alrighty, so I will be speaking about the new weight management guidelines from Obesity Canada. And overall, these guidelines are focused on helping people with obesity achieve a better quality of life. And the guidelines are meant to be a patient-centered framework where patients can become active in their health care. 
And worldwide, the new guidelines are perhaps one of the most extensive reviews of published evidence on obesity. Next slide. So there are five steps in the patient arc that will help people living with obesity achieve healthy outcomes. And the first step, next slide, um, of the patient arc is for health providers is to recognize that obesity is a complex and chronic disease. And there are two important terms here, complex and chronic. Obesity is complex because it does not affect all patients in the same way, and treating obesity therefore requires long-term support and individualized treatment. Secondly, chronic diseases are conditions that last for long periods of time, upwards of one year. And currently, obesity is not officially recognized as a chronic disease by all levels of Canadian government, despite growing clinical evidence that obesity is chronic in nature. Next slide. Um, so the second step is to assess patients to address the root causes of weight gain. And some of the root causes of weight gain include genetics, cultural practices, adverse childhood experiences, and psychological factors. And researchers have identified genes associated with obesity, and some cultures see weight gain as a sign of affluence because food may be scarce in that geographic area. And stress from childhood trauma may encourage binge eating and obesity, and conditions like depression and anxiety are also very much connected to obesity as well. The causes of obesity are often unique to a specific, specific individual, and they're intertwined together. So to identify these root causes, doctors should take a comprehensive history to develop personalized long-term health plans. And this comprehensive history will likely involve laboratory and diagnostic imaging and physical examinations as well. Next slide. Um, if you, then if, yeah, there we go. Oh, um, if you could maybe go back a slide for a second. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So if you're thinking that genetics play a huge role in obesity, think again, because humans and dogs are genetically different yet, just as there are a lot of overweight people, there are also a lot of overweight dogs. So environmental factors can greatly influence your health and your weight. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because that means that your weight is within your control. So it's interesting that, um, you know, the gene genetic pool hasn't changed, but obesity has gone up tremendously. So there is this interaction between the environment and the genetics. Some experts feel that 50% of overweight is related to genetics and 50% is related to environment. Um, yeah, we live in a toxic environment right now, so I'm changing my environment. The people I surround myself with are, are, are more active people, and I'm trying to get rid of the bad food um, from, from, your, from your house. So one of the things you can think about is that if you can, surround yourself with your spouses, friends, neighbors, clubs, support from Weight Watchers to calorie counters. To find ways to put yourself in a, in a, in a healthier environment. And... Um, you can't change your genes yet, um, but I understand this desire to eat and, and always uh, be hungry. Um, I'm always hungry. Um, I can say it's genetic, sure, but um, I'm not changing my genes just yet. But, uh, um, I, you know, you know, we didn't used to see very fat dogs and cats right now, so you can see that happening right now. So this is a really good example of saying is that uh, uh, get a dog, but get a skinny dog and, and, and do something with your dog and... Uh, and so we'll learn about is that I, I think one of the pearls of, of health is uh, surrounding yourself with healthy, healthy behavior. So uh, I'm seeing so many people get a dog. So go to the SBCA and get a rescue dog. Uh, wonderful. If, if you want a rescue dog, speak to myself or my son. We'll get you one. Uh, he's done some lot of work in that area. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Kearney. All righty. So these are um, the discussion of treatment options, the third guideline. And the new guidelines on obesity, they discuss five main types of weight loss options. Um, next slide. Well, just keep that slide up for a second. Oh, yeah. so, so one of the things we're saying is that um, if you don't deal with nutrition, um, you know, if you don't deal with physical activity, um, it's going to be very hard to lose weight. But we're also saying is that you have to put yourself in a psychological framework to be more successful. We do have some pharmacological therapies that are available, and we do that. And we have bariatric surgery, or surgery to lose weight. So we're going we're gonna to look at all these. I, think, I call these five major 
uh, pillars or five things you need to think about what might work for you and what combination of all they fit in. Um, and I will say that up until now, uh, weight management has been a colossal failure um, uh, for us as a society. So we have to think of better ways and there are better solutions right now. Um, so I'm pretty excited what we can do. Hard work is number one. Wanting to get better is number two. Next slide. Um, okay. The next slide, that's possible. Yeah. Uh, oh, if you could go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, I'll first discuss how physical activity can aid in weight loss. And the new guidelines for weight management provide very specific recommendations for physical activity. Aerobic activity for 30 to 60 minutes a day on most days of the week is strongly recommended. And aerobic activity is also known as cardio. And it includes activities like running, cycling, swimming, and brisk walking. And resistance training is the second type of physical activity that can lead to weight loss and improve weight maintenance. And resistance training can come in many different forms, like using free weights, medicine balls, or weight machines to exercise. And all of these types of resistance training involve moving the limbs against some form of resistance in order to increase muscle mass and get stronger. And finally, increasing the exercise intensity can greatly improve your fitness and reduce the amount of time needed for weight loss. Increasing intensity can look like doing a high-intensity interval training workout, which is also known as HIIT or HIIT workouts. HIIT is a cardio session arranged as short bursts of very hard work. And during each set, you are exercising at your fullest capacity. And because you are pushing yourself to your limits, each set is usually shorter in length as well. So, so we can stop there for one second. So I'll, I'll say this is that exercise by itself is not very good at promoting weight loss. It's very important for promoting weight maintenance, and it does help with weight reduction. So a sedentary person will require, if you're in your 60s, about twelve to 1,500 calories a day. If you want to lose weight, you have to be a caloric deficit of 500 calories a day. So to consume less than a thousand calories a day for a long period of time, good luck. Um, so, so to me is that I consume, or I require about three thousand five hundred calories a day because I try to keep myself exercising so I can eat more. So therefore, if I if I if I require three thousand five hundred calories a day, if I'm a deficit of five hundred calories a day, I will lose a pound in a week. Um, if you're at 1,200 calories and you want to not exercise, you have to be at le close to 700 calories a day to lose a pound a week, which is, I don't know how people can actually do that. So to me, is activity is a very integral part of activity. I get it, it's hard to exercise, you have to start somewhere. And to me, 30 minutes a, a day, most days will lower your risk of heart disease by 25%. 60 to 90 minutes of activity most days is required to lose weight and keep it off. So those are numbers to think about how to incorporate that. I'm not saying you're going to get there tomorrow. Um, and the best thing is going from something to not, or from nothing to something. We can get better and we can improve ourselves. I was just talking to a, um, a physiotherapist today, and she says you can go, go to Canadian Tire and get a recumbent bike. You can get them on sale for $300 sometimes, when they're usually about $700. I'm not saying that's a solution for everybody, but uh, that's something that you may look at. One of my saviors is um, my family, the people around me. Uh, I want to thank Mike, who got me involved in, in, in biking. I want to thank Dina, who plays tennis with me at 5 in the morning or at 9 o'clock at night time. So you have to find your solutions, and um, we can help you with that, but you have to come up with some solutions here, and I think activity is so important for mental well-being. It's a great prescription for health in many fronts. So how are you going to incorporate that? Find a way if you're serious about managing your weight, if you can do it. And we can we can help you with that, but that's a really important component. It's only one component, but it's an important one. Go ahead. Yeah, for sure. Alrighty, so HIT or HIIT is really interesting to me because it's helped me become healthier as well. Um, I grew up dancing and doing a lot of stretching. so. Something like HIIT workouts seemed really intimidating to me. 
Um, I was used to doing low intensity workouts, but because HIIT was effective and efficient, according to the people around me, I decided to give it a go. And I relied on a channel on YouTube called Lazy Mills Workouts, and I have one of their videos linked right here. That was the video that I used the most often. Um, and you can do all of them in the comfort of your own home because they're all on the internet. And from what I remember, the first workouts were really, really hard. My body was not used to doing anything that intense, and I had to pause the video every couple of minutes. And walking up the stairs to go take a shower after finishing the workout felt completely unreal because my legs always felt like jello when I was done. And that's completely expected. Struggling at the beginning of an exercise journey is that's expected. I would say that it would be weird if you weren't if you weren't being challenged. Um, I can almost guarantee you that we will fall down along the way. Maybe I'll miss a day of working out. Maybe I just can't get through the workout and I have to stop halfway. But whatever it is, it's important to not let those setbacks discourage us from starting again. It's not about being perfect. It's just about picking yourself back up and just trying again. And thankfully, the workouts eventually got easier and I could feel myself getting stronger. That was the most rewarding part, realizing that your body could do things it could never do before. Next slide. So for, for, so for some of us, and that works for Emily, you can see some things work for myself, but for you, it might be just going out there and walking five steps, walking two minutes, walking five minutes, five times a day, um, getting a recumbent bike, go, go swimming, um, you know, go for a walk around the mall, it, leaving your car a little bit further along the way, selling your car. <laughs> um, so there are different things to try, but you know what? Try something and try different things. I, I never thought, um, one of the joys I found out this year is I'm playing tennis at, at six in the morning at nine at night and I, I hear these birds that I never heard before. Um, I can't hit a tennis ball and uh, tomorrow morning uh, we're going to be there at 6 30 at Linden, Linden Park, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, two people are consistently there, myself and, and Dino. One, one, one week there's a nine year old individual. Uh, tomorrow morning uh, someone's coming out. Uh, uh, Paul's coming in there and played tennis before. So he's coming out tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm, we're playing for money. No, just kidding. Um, we're going to go and then, then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna have some fun. So just try something. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. And now I'll be talking a little bit about nutrition. So there is one general guideline when it comes to healthy eating. And that's that the best nutrition approach is one that can be maintained consistently for long periods of time. So therefore, healthy eating patterns should always be personalized to each person according to their preferences and values. And here are five examples of diets that you could go on. So the first is the Mediterranean diet, which is based on vegetables, fruits, herbs, nuts, beans, and whole grains. Um, proteins like fish, poultry, and eggs are built around the diet, and red meat is only eaten occasionally. Next, we have the vegetarian diet, which is very self-explanatory. It includes dairy foods and eggs, but no meat, no poultry, no fish, and no seafood. And then we also have the DASH diet. The DASH diet emphasizes vegetables, fruits, low-fat dairy foods, and reduced sodium levels. And then um, second to last, we have partial meal replacements. A partial meal rep replacement plan involves replacing meals with a drink or a bar, and that will control your caloric intake and promote weight loss. And finally, we have intermittent fasting. Um, this has been pretty popular and trendy, I feel like, but it doesn't specify which foods you should eat, but rather when you should eat them. So, for example, you can fast for 16 hours, and that includes the time that you spend sleeping, and then eat within an eight-hour window. Next slide. Yeah, so another interesting diet is the keto diet. And the keto diet is a low-carb, high-fat eating plan. Most of what you eat is fat, such as unsaturated fats like nuts and seeds, and saturated fats as well like coconut oil. And 20 to 30% of your diet is protein. And you're also meant to strictly limit carbs like beans and whole grains. Um, if you're on the keto diet, you want to be eating healthy fats. That's really important because... Of course, too much bacon can cause higher levels of lousy cholesterol, LDL. So opt for foods like avocados instead. And next slide. 
And we're going to explore all those diets uh, in a lot of detail. And so we're going to have specific plans to these along the way. So, uh, and uh, so we have different programs about that. And I'm actually quite impressed that they all do work. And uh, and you have to try different diets. And my analogy is that they keep adapting, trying different things. Uh, go ahead there, Emma. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I'll be explaining why the keto diet works. The keto diet works because your body will normally use sugar from carbs to fuel itself. But when you're on the keto diet, you're not consuming a lot of carbs. You're trying to limit the amount of carbs that you're consuming. So the body runs out of sugar and it burns fat instead. And this process is called nutritional ketosis. It creates fatty acid substances called ketones, which your body can use for energy. Next slide. Yeah, so there's been positive links between um, the keto diet and diabetes. Research shows that people with type 2 diabetes can slim down, lower their blood sugar levels, and use less medication while using the keto diet. And there are less studies, however, examining um, type 1 diabetes in relation to the keto diet. But one small study found that the keto diet helped people with type 1 diabetes lower their A1C levels. And an A1C test, if you have diabetes, you probably know, but it's just a blood test that measures your blood glucose levels over the past three months. And if you have type 1 diabetes, talk to your doctor before you go on the keto diet. And of course, there's also some challenges with the keto diet. It's hard to stick to because of the low amount of carbs. Your body is probably not used to consuming very few carbs. So you might feel tired before your body adapts to this diet. Um, and furthermore, because you're not eating foods like whole grains and beans, you might experience constipation as well. Um, next slide. Okay, so with the diets as well, I think it's um, quite easy to forget about liquid calories, and we can actually consume a lot of our calories in a day from beverages. Um, just uh, most of the time, if you grab a double-double on your way to work in the morning, um, or you're getting um, some sort of iced coffee and such with cream and sugar, they can run you about 200 to 300 calories just in that one uh, drink, and most of the time we don't really feel full, so we're pairing it with things like a bagel or a breakfast sandwich. Um, so that's where we can lose a lot of our um, calories for the day. And like Dr. Creamy mentioned, a lot of the times um, to be at the optimal uh, caloric range to actually see our weight loss results, we're looking at around 700 to 1,000 calories. Um, and if that one coffee is around two to 300 calories, that's almost like a third of our calories gone for the day. Um, so it's really important to consider other options. Water should be our number one choice because it's zero calories. Um, as well, things like black coffee and black tea, if you can get used to the taste, those have um, fewer calories, so you're able to have more cups if you need if you're drinking coffee for the, um, for the caffeine. As well, oh, we've listed here a couple of um, milks, and just to kind of see the difference between how many calories regular milk can have, and if you can make smaller changes like switching to skim milk and then switching to almond milk and such, um, it is going to be beneficial in the long run in terms of uh, limiting the amount of calories you're drinking. So I was actually really surprised when you when you showed me this story for the first time. I didn't realize that a double double, which is the most common coffee order at Tim Horton, a large one, is two hundred and sixty four calories. Mm -hmm. I always knew a glass of milk was about one hundred fifty calories. And that's not really a small glass of milk. I don't know about you. That I'll have two or three of those before I get started, and, and that, so you don't feel full about that. So wow. Calories just slip in there, don't they? So, so one way is that uh, the best liquid calories are basically in vegetable soup, which are uh, tomato-based, and that, that's one way of volumetrics. Uh, so there's one clue. If people, there's been randomized data that people have two glasses of water, I mentioned word, water, the start of every meal for six glasses a day, you will lower your weight by about five pounds. Uh, so... Um, you can see if you had uh, two double doubles every time you had a coffee break, you're going to gain uh, five pounds pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, next slide. Um, as well, I've just listed a couple other common beverages that uh, most of us probably consume on a daily basis. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out as well is a lot of people are, um, you know, have concerns about switching to diet pops and, and diet drinks as well. Um, we have mentioned in other webinars before that, you know, if you're getting used to transitioning um, away from things like pop 
um, to things more like um, sparkling water and such. Using Diet Coke as kind of a stepping stone to getting or kind of weaning yourself off pop entirely is a good idea. Um, but overall, there's not a lot of extensive research done on, on the effects of um, drinking diet beverages and such. As well, things like alcohol, um, as was mentioned before, um, we want to be able to lower our triglycerides and alcohol spikes our triglycerides a lot. Um, so the best way to lower your triglycerides is to cut out alcohol entirely. Um, and you can see here things like a can of beer and a glass of wine. If you have multiple glasses of wine with dinner, um, that's adding unnecessary calories as well. So those are just areas to kind of consider cutting out of your diet as you go along the week. So this is actually very interesting. At one time, I used to drink orange juice. I don't drink orange juice. Uh, an orange is about 100 calories. I feel full. They're the fiber content. So, And um, alcohol is very interesting is that uh, I think if you're serious about losing weight is that uh, you need to look at liquid calories and avoid them. And alcohol, unfortunately, is, is, is very rich in calories. And during our uh, pandemic, we're drinking more alcohol. And uh, I, I think we're all trying to lose weight. And uh, alcohol, just, just the opposite of that effect. So, And there's actually more and more body research. So initially looked at you know diet beverages. So uh, initially, there, was, were, there were two randomized controlled trials that showed that artificial sweeteners in uh, middle-aged women lowered... Um, Lowered, lo lowered your weight by about uh, two to five pounds. But more recently, there's been a series of newer randomized trials showing that uh, diet colas, diet pop, doesn't lower weight. So I, I think the way you point out, Zoya, it, it, I think it's better than regular Coke. Um, it's a good transition food, but it's not a good long-term solution. And there's some actually data that diet beverages might affect the microflora in your GI system in an adverse effect. So uh, I think we're learning a lot about that. So uh, um, so I'm trying to uh, get away from uh, diet pop myself at this stage. And uh, and I know anything that tastes too good, you tend to eat more of. So uh, and uh, so be careful about that. So I don't think it's a great long-term solution for, 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 for most of us. Uh, and certainly alcohol is lots of calories. And it's, it, you know... Um, you're going to hear George uh, talk about soon about uh, different medical problems, and he's probably seeing a lot of atrial fibrillation from, from alcohol uh, making that process worse as well. So lots to do, lots of change there. That's a big change. Thank you. So these are the a summary of the good foods in blue and the bad foods in, 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 uh, in red for just overall health. So uh, basically... Um, Food is a combination of all these ingredients, and to lose weight, we still have to have a caloric deficit, about 500 calories per day or 3,500 calories uh, to lose a pound. And uh, and so I'm really trying to change my diet. Yeah, I really have chocolate cheesecake for breakfast, but it's not a, it's, it's not a it's not a healthy food. And having a muffin is basically having cake for breakfast. So um, lots of things to change and uh, lots of things to look at and. Uh, and lots to sort out. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Anything you want to comment about this, Zoya, as well, or uh, Emily, about the diet? One of the foods that I, is that's becoming more impressive to me is uh, uh, is something called pure EPA found in uh, certain and, and, and things like salmon and things of that nature as well. And there's supplementation showing benefits. So I, I'm trying to um, – well, I, became, I, I gave up red meat and, and, and chicken. Um, I'm still eating fish, and, um, and so I have to – and one of the reasons I, I've given up uh, animal products is for the planet, and eating fish is not saving the planet right now. So I'm, I'm rethinking that as, as time goes on. But I'm trying to eat all these fruits and vegetables. And right now, this is a great time in Ontario. We have lots of fruits and vegetables. Eat them. Any other comments from anybody else there on the panel? Um, I would just say for um, foods that are in the blue region as well, um, although they do have lots of benefits, they also tend to be quite calorically dense. So I think it's important to just keep in mind, like, portioning out how much of each you're having. Like, if you're having a fatty fish or um, um, vegetables like um, avocados and such, just to kind of portion them accordingly so that you're you're not overeating and uh, gaining the weight back. Good point. Thank you. <laughs> Another patient story. Let's let's hear. Let's hear. What, this is what happened in clinic this week. Just go ahead. Go ahead and play this. Uh, this was just just remarkable. Antonio. And uh, so you lost some weight. You lost about, say, 15 pounds? 
Yeah, close to it's twelve yeah. to fifteen pounds. And what are you doing? I'm biking uh, five times a week for about thirty kilometers a day. And uh, so you're biking. He's biking thirty kilometers five times a week. Yeah. He's watching what he's eating. He's also taking medication called Ozempic. Correct. Ozempic That's is good for your diabetes. It's to control my blood sugar mostly because I wasn't really mad at diabetes yet. Well, no, you had diabetes. People, I love this. Everybody says, I just have a little bit of diabetes. Well, you, you had a so-called little bit of diabetes. Your hemoglobin A1C was 6.8%. Right. That means that half the cells that make insulin are dead. The, the, worst, the, the rest are working overtime. So that's, okay, okay. that's a little bit of diabetes. That, to me, that's a lot of diabetes. Well, I don't know. Uh, that's okay. That's what I get. But you know, one of the things, one of the magic is if you can lose 20 pounds, you're getting close to that. And to me, what I'm seeing is a combination of biking. I, I yeah. lost weight too as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm biking too. Right. I'm playing tennis. Yeah, yeah, everything else. Yeah, yeah, everything else. So, so, and I'm using, you're being smart about it. You're taking the right medication, which is a uh, medication called right. Ozempic. Right. And you're also doing lifestyle changes. Right. So, what do you tell people who can't lose weight? Well, uh, control what you're eating. If you take some medicine, you have to take it. Right time and do some uh, some exercise, some biking or uh, walking, whatever needs uh, to lose those calories. It's one of the hardest things in the world to lose weight, and uh, but there are many steps that you can take. And what I what I see from so many people is, I'll do it next time. Well, I never had it, <laughs> but you've done it, and if you can do it, I can do it. Yeah. You can too. No, you just you just gotta put it in your head. When the next day comes, you have to do it. Not yeah. saying don't always say, "Oh, I'll do it tomorrow," because then it will never happen. And you know we're gonna have to Right now we're at a good time, but one day we're gonna gain some weight again. So we just take it one day at a time. So I'm saying for the next thirty days, do something different, right? And uh, and do that over and over again, and let's just do it. That's the way it is. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. You see, uh, you know, we talk about the, the, the different pillars that we talked about. There's a component of diet. There's a component of uh, exercise. There's a component of psychological being the right place, the right time, and medication. So he required four pillars to uh, to put his diabetes into remission at this stage. Um, um, and you know, the principle sounds so simple. Practice is so hard. I'm, I'm still, I think we're going to be struggling. And, and you mentioned, Emily, it's a chronic disease. We're going to have ups and downs about this. You know, it's like, it's life. And we go ups and downs, and, and then we move forward to this. And look, look at this. And I said, so we can all get better. And, and he got better. Uh, and, and this problem will never go away, but it's very manageable. Uh, I love the story. And that just happened this week. Yeah, nice. Okay, I really like that patient story too. Um, and just as Dr. Kearney mentioned, there's also psychological factors involved as well. So I'll be speaking a little bit about psychological and behavioral interventions. And there are three main recommendations from Obesity Canada. First, they recommend that healthcare providers use something called multi-component psychological interventions for patients. And this just involves combining psychological therapies and behavioral therapies together. Psychological therapies can include things like CBT, acceptance therapy, and behavioral therapies include goal setting, self-monitoring, cognitive restructuring, and relapse prevention. And healthcare providers will also provide healthcare plans that help patients develop competence, motivation, and they should help encourage um, patients to set realistic and achievable goals. And we have a section on SMART goals that will be talking about that. Um, the care plans can also help patients analyze setbacks using problem solving and adaptive thinking. And finally, healthcare providers will follow up with patients to facilitate self efficacy and intrinsic motivation. So, the main purpose of using um, psychological and behavioral interventions is to help people with obesity make sustainable, long term life changes that promote self esteem and confidence. Next slide. So what this means to me is that a lot of fancy words, but basically you as an individual, well, what is your plan of action going to be? What are the things, steps you're going to do? Um, I'm going to go to the gym three times a week, five days a week. You know, someone says, I'm waiting for the gym to open up. Well, I'm, uh, we're, we're, I'm going for a walk. I bought a, I got a new dog. 
we're doing and we're going we're not going to you know restaurants are in trouble right now and part of that's a good thing because most of us go out to restaurants we eat bad food um so you need to come up with well, 10 steps that you're going to do differently i'm going to weigh myself five days a week i'm going to go walk the dog with my spouse 30 minutes in the morning 30 minutes at night time uh we're going to eliminate all bad food, and uh, Zoya's going to take a picture of my fridge, and she's going to throw people out. Emily's going to help motivate me, um, and I and uh, those are some of the steps. But you have to be concrete. And if you wait for the government to do it, or if you wait for somebody else to do it, you can wait a long time. Stop waiting. Do something. Do something today, and do something every day, and try something different. And what we're going to say is do it for 30 days, and we'll tell you about why in just a little while. Yeah, for sure. So making life changes is really important. That starts with just doing one thing a day. Um, and that comes hand in hand with resilience. And we recently did a webinar on resilience, which you can access by just clicking on that video link. Um, and if you're interested in being a part of a support group aimed at discussing the emotional challenges of weight loss, reach out to Dr. Kern Yu and his team because we would love to support and help you on your health care journey. So this, this, is, this video is, is a wonderful collection of just different resources and different ways of doing this. I've seen this video many times. Some days I can do it, some days I can't. But I, I keep coming back to this, and I, I think everybody should look at this. It's just a wonderful uh, webinar, and uh, it's just well done. So just take a look at it when you get a chance. And play it multiple times. I have. I, I, I will continue to do so. Yep. Okay. So now we'll be talking about pharmacotherapy and treating obesity. So, pharmacotherapy, that's just a fancy name for using medications. And it's recommended in individuals with a BMI of greater than or equal to 30 kilograms per meter squared or a BMI of greater than or equal to 27 kilograms per meter squared. And taking medications will be probably combined with other interventions like physical activity, um, bettering your nutrition, and also maybe psychological or behavioral interventions. So right. we get the body mass index of over 30 for everybody. But if you have medical issues, like you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, you have heart disease, we, we, we're willing to look at medications when your BMI is over 27. So... Um, so again, this is one number uh, to, to think about. It's not the sole number, but it's an important number. Again, as you point out, Emily, for every unit, or I think, uh, sorry, Devanchi was telling us, for every unit increasing BMI, risk of bad things happen to you. So um, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be better or, or trying harder or trying differently. Go ahead. Yep, yeah, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so one of the medications that we've um, looked into at the clinic and that is currently used for weight loss is Contrase. So it, it combines a low dose of naltrexone, which is normally used to manage opioid dependency, and bupropion, which is used for smoking cessation. So both of them kind of work in the brain in two separate areas, and they um, work to control eating habits by suppressing cravings um, and feelings of hunger at times. So they're normally a pill um, that's taken, and the approximate price is around $325 a month, and it's not, um, I believe it's not covered. So it is quite expensive, um, but this is one of the kind of um, solutions that we have on the market currently that people are looking at to taking. So Contrave does suppress appetite. Um, it's also, um, it, uh, but it costs $325 a month forever. Um, so you have to take it to lose weight and to maintain weight because once you stop all these medications, you don't stop blood pressure pills too often, you don't stop cholesterol pills. It's look at long-term solutions. It's not covered by the government, uh, but from some drug players. And um, and uh, so this is actually the retail price of that, that medication. So um, And uh, so um, I, I, I do like it. I do think it's worthwhile for a number of people, but it's a, an expensive option. And what's the average weight reduction there, uh, Zoya? That's actually on our next slide. If you okay. just go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so basically, the average weight loss is about, you know, it varies from about 5% to 10% of their weight. Um, in one of the 56-week studies that they did with Contrib, which was combined with some health habit changes, 
Um, the, the people lost about 9% of their starting weight compared to someone who was just doing um, health habit changes and wasn't taking Contrave, where they lost about 5% of their weight. Um, and in clinical trials, you know, they've studied about 4,500 people, and this drug has helped people keep off the weight for up to a year. So on average, those who took Contrave for about six months and, you know, combined it with their weight management program, they lost about 25 pounds. And those who are on a placebo or like, you know, were just doing a weight management program, they lost an average about 17 pounds. So this drug gives you an extra between 5 to 20 pounds um, um, long term. And this, so this, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not magic. It's, you can see that you need a lot of lifestyle changes with this. Um, it does suppress appetite. One of the things that nighttime eaters, that might be something to, to consider. Um, it uh, so it does have its role, but it, it's you know, um, but it's expensive and it's not and it's not covered by the government. Um, and it's something you have to think about. Is that something you want to try? And uh, roughly, on average, roughly twenty five percent of people won't respond to it. So you try it for a month, or for a couple months, and if it doesn't work, uh, it's not the right job. You might have to change uh, your approach, and it wasn't the right time for you, but. Uh, that's the way this drug looks like, um, and, uh, uh, and we, we can talk about some of the contraindications next. We'll the next slide there. Mm -hmm. And here's how it works. Yes. Okay. Are we on the next slide? Yeah, we're, we are. Okay, sorry, I just can't see it. Okay, so um, in terms of the the brain, I just wanted to kind of break it down a little bit to explain the science behind how it works. So it works in the hypothalamus in the brain, which is our hunger center, um, and it releases hunger-reducing neurotransmitters, basically. Um, so there's two different areas that are stimulated, and so the bupropion and the naltrexone kind of work together. Um, and so it regulates dopamine, and that's um, one of the hormones or the neurotransmitters that plays a role in how we feel pleasure. So it kind of regulates this to reduce cravings. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I kind of just wanted to break it down a little further um, and show kind of the reasons why we consume food. So we have the primary pathway, which is called homeostatic eating, homeostatic eating, and that's just um, when we feel hungry, when we need to eat because um, we need um, energy to maintain regular metabolic functions. And then there's also hedonic eating, and that's more involved with pleasure and reward, um, the reward system in our brain and kind of um, eating to fulfill or to satisfy that um, pleasure. And a lot of the times things like stress eating or emotional eating can fall under this category as well where we're not necessarily eating um, because we need the energy, but it's kind of satisfying that reward pathway. Um, so it's really important to kind of just be conscious and aware of this um, when we are making food choices um, and try to couple eating with um, things like drinking water like Dr. Shani mentioned before every meal and such to change our habits a little bit along the way. Next slide. So these are some of the contraindications um, and kind of the criteria to be taking contra. So we're, uh, it's looking at people with a body mass index greater than 30. Um, and then also if you have one of the conditions as well that's listed here, I won't read all of them out, but um, they're listed there. And then as well, so if you are on opioids of any kind, you won't be able to take Contrave because essentially Contrave is blocking the mechanisms in which opioids try to target. Um, and then as well, if you have a seizure disorder, if you're pregnant, um, uncontrollable hypertension, alcohol abuse, and are taking other specific medications, um, you won't be able to take Contrave. So it's important to discuss this with your um, physician as well. Okay, next slide. So another medication um, that we wanted to talk about today is Ozempic. So Ozempic is a non-insulin medication that's um, primarily used, and it is approved to treat um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So when we're talking about this in the context of weight loss, it's not a drug that is approved for weight loss. Um, however, studies have shown that Ozempic does, um, is, is responsible for um, almost 9 to 12 pounds of weight loss, which I will show in a future slide. Um, so it's normally used to reduce reduce risk of um, cardiovascular disease in adults with type 2 diabetes, but it has shown effects in weight loss as well. And so just here, um, the price is around $245 for a 0.5 and a 1 milligram pen, and each pen is approximately one month supply. So this is, again, a medication that you would need to continuously take, um, so you will need a new pen each month. 
So it's a small little injection that's given once a week. Um, it's a very small little needle. Uh, it lowers blood sugar in people with diabetes, and if your blood sugar is normal, it doesn't affect blood sugar. And more importantly, it uh, slows your motility in your stomach, so everything moves slower there. So uh, you have to eat slower, and and you and also suppresses appetite in the brain. Um, and it, it's really uh, it has made some remarkable properties. But the drug is approved and used in Ontario. It's paid for by the government for diabetes. It's not approved or paid for or recommended from the government um, in non-diabetics. But uh, those are something to think about. And uh, next, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go next ahead. slide. Next slide. Um, so the cost is quite high for uh, for Zempic. It's two hundred forty five dollars a month, approximately. Um, there are ways to kind of modify um, the product a little bit so that you are getting more for um, what you have. So uh, on the pen, I don't have a video to demonstrate, but like Dr. Kearney mentioned, it, it is an injection. And so there's a little dial on the side, which you'll uh, be changing to adjust for the dosage, and then you will inject the needle. Um, depending on how you turn the dial, there are a certain amount of clicks that you can um, manually adjust for to get each of the following dosages. So I've just listed them here. Um, that might be helpful because given that it is quite pricey, this is another way that you can kind of get more out of your pen um, for the for the dosage needed. And it's just worth mentioning as well, I think Dr. Kearney, like you said, 0.5 is normally um, what most people would need for the Ozempic dosage. Um, so that would be approximately. So depending on what the, the, there's two pens available. If you use the right pen at 0.5 milligrams uh, a day with the 37 clicks, you can get it to about... Uh, $150 a month. Um, so that's uh, how you can use uh, that, that the medication in that circumstance. And uh, uh, so that's really an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. So this is just um, another slide detailing the same information. Uh, but just to point out again, so the pen has different dosages. So it's important to consult your physician on um, which dose you should be on. Normally, the starting dose is 0.25 milligrams, and then it increases to 0.5 after a certain amount of weeks. Uh, um, next slide. And then and these are just um, the contraindications, which Devonji will talk about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, in this case, what it means, like, what you those that cannot take Ozempic are, you know, someone, you or any of your family members that have suffered um, medullary thyroid cancer, or if you had, you know, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, um, or if you're allergic to some of the, the ingredients in Ozempic. Um, and some of the side effects include, you know, pancreatitis, um, changes in vision, low blood sugar levels, um, kidney problems, and serious allergic reactions. Um, so it, I'll say this is that it's not a major issue for, for most of us. It, it, uh, if you get low blood sugar, it's because people with diabetes are using something else. So Ozempic really doesn't cause low blood sugar by itself. Uh, if you have recurrent inflammation of the pancreas, you should be thinking about this. And if people that have bad eye disease from diabetes, you have to make sure that you understand what type of eye disease you have. And if you lower blood sugar too aggressively, you can actually cause... Uh, uh, blindness or worsening vision. So that's people in advanced retinopathy for diabetes. So these are just some of the things to think about and something that uh, it won't stop me from the vast majority of people, but we just have to pause and make sure uh, this medication is right for you. As uh, so I have points before, if you're taking uh, narcotics, you can't go on contrave. Um, and uh, so there's certain things you just have to run through your pharmacist and your physician about this. So, uh, um, uh, But uh, these medications are one of the new pillars that uh, we talked about, and these are uh, medications that can lead to basically five to 20 pound weight reduction uh, in people uh, uh, and their, their long-term solutions as well. Will you use these drugs off-label? I currently am using Ozempic off-label, and uh, I don't know too many people who want to be on chronic medications for weight reduction long-term, but we say this is a chronic disease, and you need to consider this as a chronic problem um, and to, to look at that, and it's not to say that you can't do different things to different folks, but this is actually a couple of really breakthrough medications. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so basically, how much weight do people lose on Ozempic? In a one-year study, um, people who were weighing, you know, about an average of 197 pounds or around 90 kilograms, 
they took the one milligram dose and on average they lost about 12 pounds or five kilograms and people who weighed in about you know 198 pounds um they took the 0.5 milligram dosage and they lost about nine pounds um and again like the optimal dosage is for for most users is 0.5 milligram okay next slide Okay, so we've talked about um, Ozempic, we've talked about Contrave. The last one that we're going to be talking about is Sexenda. So it's similar to Ozempic in the sense that it is in a pen and it's also um, one that you will inject. It's um, a medication that mimics glucagon like peptide 1, um, and so that's where it kind of um, has an effect in decreasing appetite in the amount of food you consume. So it, it is an injection. It is quite expensive, as you can see as well. The price per month is approximately $455. And so um, like all of these medications, they are almost lifelong medications. And once you stop, there's a high probability um, that you will re regain all the weight, especially if you're not adjusting your eating habits and your exercise habits while taking the medication. Um, it's important that the medication is one factor, but as well, making lifestyle changes is another. And you have to think about um, being able to sustain these changes long term um, if you ever want to be off these medications. Next slide. So, so Sixinta is basically Ozempic, but it's basically Sixinta is daily, uh, Ozempic is weekly, and they're really roughly the same drug, just from a tweeting of the drug. And uh, you can see Sixinta is substantially more expensive, and that's why. Um, uh, I don't use Senda. I, 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 I use Ozempic because you can do the same thing at, uh, uh, at, a, a, at a better cost and things of that nature. But Senda is approved for weight reduction, uh, where Ozempic is approved for diabetes. Uh, Ozempic will probably be approved for um, uh, weight reduction in, in the future um, at this stage. So these are some certainly some options to consider uh, for some of us. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not paid for by the government. Of, of any government or the government of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, so these are this is just some of the criteria as well. Having a BMI over thirty, um, as well, like it says here, it's um, indicated to be used in conjunction with reduced calorie diet and an increase in physical activity. So it's important to keep that balance um, of both. Next slide. It's, all these drugs are approved for people with a body mass index over 30 or 27 with risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so how much weight do people lose in um, Zenda? Um, so basically, in this case, you know, the study participants were given, you know, both the reduced calorie diet as well as an exercise regimen. And they were then either given the uh, the medication or they were given the placebo. And those that took that medication, on average, they lost about 18 and a half pounds over that 56 weeks, whereas on the placebo, they only lost about six pounds. And the users that uh, that that also took that medication, they you know experienced the health benefits such as lower cholesterol, lower blood sugar levels, and better diabetes control. And that's actually important that you bring this out because if you lower weight, you have less need for blood pressure medications, you have less depression, less less uh, diabetes medications. Um, you know, so you know it's a trade-off, and you can see that we talked about when we start off with overweight causes problems. Losing weight helps with, with many of these problems as well. But the reason we actually point this out is, it's you know you're not going to lose 100 pounds with these medications. You're not going to reverse. Um, uh, uh, you know, psychological problems, if those are what's stopping you. Um, and, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to eat anything you want to. Uh, you're not, you're not going to have to give up your exercise program. It's certainly a, a useful pillar. Um, I think of the Toronto Raptor um, uh, basketball team. They're composed of a bunch of great players, and, uh, and these medications are good players. Um, and uh, but they're not magical players. They're not. They're not going to solve the problem on, on, on their own. But there's certainly something you need to look at if it's right for you. And if you want to discuss that with us, we'll be glad to uh, look at that with you at any point in time. Um, okay, next. next slide. Um, so those who can cannot take uh, this medication would be you know again. Same thing if any of the family members have either had the, the cancer, the thyroid cancer, or if you had, you know, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, 
Um, again, if you're allergic to the ingredients of, of this medication, again, you cannot take this, um, uh, this weight loss medication. And the side effects include things such as headaches, vomiting, um, low blood sugar, well, um, decreased um, appetites and stomach problems, as well as tiredness. Next slide. Oh, back one more. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, awesome. Um, so Xenical is a prescription medication. Again, this is another weight loss medication. It's um, used for uh, weight loss, weight maintenance, and, you know, to help uh, prevent weight regain after a diet. And it basically helps prevent the fat-absorbing enzyme that's known as lipase from working um, to cause a decrease in the amount of fat that is being absorbed from the food. And, you know, if you have less fat, you have less fewer calories in the body, and therefore it leads to that weight loss. But it doesn't have any effect on the appetite. It, it basically just works inside of the body to prevent that fat absorbing um, within the body. And the usual recommended dose is 120 milligrams, um, one capsule three times a day with meals containing fat. And Xenical can may be taken up during the meal or up to an hour after. And again, the price is 177.34 dollars for 120 milligram um, uh, capsule. Okay, uh, next slide. So, okay. Sorry, you can, did you wanna add something? No, no, sorry, keep going. Okay. <laughs> You're doing perfect. Okay. Um, so in terms of criteria, you know, Xenical cannot be used for everyone. Again, the BMI is 30 or greater or 27 or greater with a presence of any weight-related conditions such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia. Um, and you must lose at least about 5% of your weight by the three months um, because if not, then the treatment would be stopped. Um, and you cannot take Zeneca if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, people that are under 18 are not eligible for this. Um, people with any condition where the food is not absorbed properly or people with cholestasis where, you know, the bowel doesn't flow um, properly from liver to duodenum. And um, side effects include oily spottings, uh, bowel movements, diarrhea, and weakness. Uh, next slide. And basically, the amount of weight that is lost with Xenical is about, um, it's up to 10%. You know, it is effective when it's used with the conjunction of a healthy eating plan. And it's shown to reduce your body weight for up to 10% um, when you are combining it with some sort of weight loss program. Um, in a study that was done at the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas, it was found that after a year, 57% of, of the patients that were taking Xenical lost more than 5% of their initial weight compared to 34% of patients that were only taking the placebo um, and maintained that similar diet. Um, and it also helps control or cut the total amount of cholesterol levels, as well as your mean blood pressure compared to the diet alone. Next slide. So if we just back up one there, so Xenical is an older drug. It's been around for a long time. And basically, as a third, it's a lipase inhibitor. That means a third of the fat that you eat comes out your rear end. Um, so that means if you have a high fat meal, you will stool your pants. Um, and if you're on a, so way to overcome that is replace fat with carbohydrate. So, uh, what you can do is go from fat to sugar. So if you say I'm on a low fat diet, um, Xenical is not going to work. Uh, if you're saying you're on a, um, I'm sorry, if you're on a high fat diet, it works extremely well. Low fat diet, it just it won't work. So it can give you a gauge of how much fat's in your diet. Um, and, and so it's, it's an older medication. It's been around for, for a while. It's not no, nowhere as strong as the, the, the first medications we talked about, like Sendo, Zempic, or Contrave. But it's an old friend. It's been around for a little bit. And it's something worth exploring in people who eat too much fat in their diet and want to find out about that. Uh, so, uh, so we'll just put that there. So, so these are the pillars for, um, for, for medications. And now the real big change is... Uh, bariatric surgery. Um, so uh, let's hear about uh, what the, the new excitement right now. Um, um, so I like medications. They're, they're, to me, they're, they're good workhorses, but they're expensive workhorses, and they're, uh, they, they certainly have their role. And, uh, and uh, I'd love to, now, now I'm really excited to hear what we know about uh, surgery for weight reduction. Mm -hmm. 
So the next treatment option after pharmacotherapy is bariatric surgery. And bariatric surgery is considered for people with a BMI of greater than or equal to 40 kilograms per meter squared or a BMI of greater than or equal to 35 kilograms per meter squared with at least one obesity-related disease. And bariatric surgery will be further discussed later on in this presentation. Next slide. Um, so Zoya will be talking a little bit about the different apps for tracking your weight, uh, weight loss and weight management. Perfect, perfect. So all the apps listed here are in fact free. So if you have any kind of device, um, a cell phone, a tablet, um, you will be able to download these. So a couple of good ones on the left are MyPlate and Lose It. They're both calorie tracking apps. Um, so, you know, I would recommend as well, if you can, just manually write it down, kind of the process of looking up how many calories are in the food you're eating um, and writing it down kind of really sticked, or at least it stuck, it stuck for me. Um, but as well, if you're on the go and you want to be able to track specific foods, um, having these apps on your phone is really helpful. As well, my fitness pal lets you combine um, exercise data with your um, diet as well. So if you exercise that day, you can put that in as well, and it'll give you the total amount of calories that you've consumed for the day um, incorporating exercise. And then lastly, if you have a Fitbit or a smartwatch or anything like that, um, for example, Fitbit has a little platform that you can download um, and sync your watch to. So um, the steps that you've done as well will be converted into numbers, and then it'll give you um, an output of how many calories you've actually burned for the day. So all of these things are kind of helpful just to keep track um, as you're on your weight loss journey. Next slide. Okay. Um, so these are also some helpful links. Um, hopefully we can link them in the video as well. Uh, the one that I have at the top is a new um, new link that I just came across. It was featured in the BMJ Journal um, this year. And so it's a series of podcasts done by um, really well-known professionals and, and doctors around the, uh, around the world. And um, they have different podcasts on different aspects of food. So they talk about high-fat diets, um, salt, um, diet and diabetes and such. So I think they're um, a great educational tool for anyone to check out who's interested in learning more about food science and how it affects their body. And then as well, there's a couple other websites that I've listed. Forks Over Knives is a really great resource for anyone who's considering becoming a plant-based eater. Um, they have vegan recipes that are um, really easy to follow and transition well for um, lots of different substitutes for meats and alternatives. Um, so those are definitely some links to check out. Next slide. Um, as well, since we're, we're talking about all of the different types of um, programs and platforms that we can use for weight loss, just to kind of put it in perspective as well, Weight Watchers, which is a common program that um, individuals have used in the past for weight loss, um, currently, right now, because of the situation with COVID, they are doing um, online workshops. So um, this whole kind of service as a whole is about $60 a month. And then as well, um, Jenny Craig um, is another kind of weight loss service where they provide frozen meals um, that are portioned out specifically for the day. Um, and so kind of subscribing to that lifestyle is approximately $30 a day. So that can cost almost $800 a month. Um, so that's just kind of to put things in perspective a little bit of, of how much um, these programs actually cost. Next slide. Okay, so um, since we've talked a lot about um, psychological factors, health factors, and how they, they both play a role in weight loss, um, it's really important as well, I think, to bring up SMART goals and goal setting in general. Um, a lot of the times weight loss can seem very overbearing and a huge burden and um, there's a lot of things involved in it. It's a very complex kind of issue because it can affect self-esteem, um, interaction, your relationship with food, your relationship with your family. And so I think it's really important to set realistic goals um, so that you can see your progress along the way. And it's okay to take a step back and reevaluate um, if you don't feel like what you're doing is working. So if we just go to the next slide, I kind of put a template for how to set SMART goals. I think it would be really good if Everyone had a few minutes now to kind of take out a pen and paper and just write down um, one goal that they want to achieve in the next 30 days. It doesn't have to be something super big. It can be something 
um, as small as just, you know, walking more, like going for a walk every day or um, cutting out alcohol for the week. Um, something that you know that you can kind of achieve. And I think it's also really important when we talk about this goal being measurable and attainable um, to kind of look at your support system at home. Do you have resources or do you need resources? Um, all of us at the clinic are really committed to helping you on your weight loss journey. So um, if there's anything at all we can provide as students, I know that we um, are really um, eager and excited to help you in any way. Um, so just let us know, but um, it'd be really great if you could fill this out. Yeah, sorry, and Dr. Kearney, were you taking if you, if you want to share that too, you can just email it us to drkearney at p32 gmail.com and if any of the supports that you want. So Emily talked about you need the psychological supports. If you need the medication discussion about this, you need the bariatric surgery and you need to uh, talk about different things, uh, let us know and let us know how we can help you. And um, um, and I think, you know, putting things on paper is, 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 is a good thing. Um, and, uh, and, then, and moving forward and not being hard on yourself. I'm not hard on myself because I gained a pound this week. I'm just going to try differently next week. Yeah. So um, I think as well we will link a, um, a hard copy of this form on the YouTube video if you want to come back to it later and fill it out. Uh, but I think it's a really good um, tool or way to kind of start your weight loss journey um, right from the beginning. Next slide. In our book, 30 Days to Healthier You, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, there's all sorts of different – those forms are in place. And speaking of folks, uh, this is a wonderful video. Let, let, I'll be quiet for a little bit. Have a listen. A few years ago, I felt like I was stuck in a rut. So I decided to follow in the footsteps of the great American philosopher, Morgan Spurlock, and try something new for 30 days. The idea is actually pretty simple. Think about something you've always wanted to add to your life and try it for the next 30 days. It turns out 30 days is just about the right amount of time to add a new habit or subtract a habit, like watching the news, from your life. There's a few things that I learned while doing these 30-day challenges. The first was, instead of the months flying by forgotten, the time was much more memorable. This was part of a challenge I did to take a picture every day for a month, and I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing that day. I also noticed that as I started to do more and harder 30-day challenges, my self-confidence grew. I went from desk-dwelling computer nerd to the kind of guy who bikes to work for fun. Even last year, I ended up hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. I would never have been that adventurous before I started my 30-day challenges. I also figured out that if you really want something badly enough, you can do anything for 30 days. Have you ever wanted to write a novel? Every November, tens of thousands of people try to write their own 50,000-word novel from scratch in 30 days. It turns out, all you have to do is write 1,667 words a day for a month. So I did. By the way, the secret is not to go to sleep until you've written your words for the day. You might be sleep deprived, but you'll finish your novel. Now, is my book the next great American novel? No, I wrote it in a month. It's awful. But for the rest of my life, if I meet John Hodgman at a TED party, I don't have to say, I'm a computer scientist. No, no, if I want to, I can say, I'm a novelist. <laughs> so here's one last thing I'd like to mention. I learned that when I made small sustainable changes, things I could keep doing, they were more likely to stick. There's nothing wrong with big, crazy challenges. In fact, they're a ton of fun, but they're less likely to stick. When I gave up sugar for 30 days, day 31 looked like this. <laughs> so here's my question to you. What are you waiting for? I guarantee you the next 30 days are going to pass whether you like it or not. 
So why not think about something you have always wanted to try and give it a shot for the next 30 days? Thanks. I love that. Great story. I love TED Talks. What's our next song? Oh, oh. Um, okay, so this is basically like a 30 day challenge that Dr. Kernow and I discussed at the clinic and we were like, you know, you should do something for 30 days. Maybe like do a 30 day diet or a 30 day physical exercise, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and use a 30 day progress, progress tracker, you know, keep a weight log, an activity log or a food log to just keep a track of everything, you know, write it down. You want to add all your SMART goals. You know, repeat those goals way more than a hundred times and write those down. And you know, you want to commit yourself on paper because then it shows how much you have improved. Um, we have added, you know, those logs, the different types of logs in the 130 days uh, to a healthier you novel. Um, it's at the back. Um, and yeah, did you want to add something, Dr. Kernier? Well, it's interesting. You can look at this book and say this is 30 days to a healthier you, or this is 130 days, uh, how you look at it. So this is actually 30 days to a healthier you. Now, I can say I'm a novelist, but it only took me 25 years to write this book uh, with the help of, of, of hundreds of people. It's a book I'm very proud of. And my advice is, is follow that TED Talk, do something healthy for 30 days. Now, this book is $30. It goes to charity, the whole thing. And if you do 30 days, three challenges over the next, if you sign up before, before, before Labor Day, is that um, I will contribute for every 30-day challenge $30 to a charity to make the world healthier. So this is something that if, if you want, the book is, you're welcome to, to, to purchase the book. The money goes to charity. And every time you do something healthy for the next 30 days, for three times, uh, you can raise money for charity and, and do something healthy for yourself if that's what you want to do. This young lady has, has done a lot of marvelous things. She's mentioned, I can't even pronounce that mountain. Uh, what's, it, what's it called? What's the mountain in Africa again? What's it called? Kilimanjaro? What's it? It's Kilimanjaro. Sorry, so I can't even pronounce that. She's climbed that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, she, she, she's amazing. And, uh, and she actually worked at an orphanage along the way, along the way. So I'm going to follow her footsteps. That's a place I want to do and want to, one of the goal sets I, I have there. Um, so um, do something, repeat it many times, try different things. And, that, and that's that, that simple. Um, and as Zoya will point out, pick achievable goals. So for to me, I pick impossible goals um, um, that, uh, that I, I want to do over time. But, you know, just pick some goals and try something. It's kind of fun. It's the journey that's more important. Not so much the, uh, the, the achievement of the goal, it's, it's the, the trying the new things. Remember, those three days are going to happen with you or without you putting your goals on, on, uh, on paper there. So that's wonderful. Thank you. So, um, uh, who is the captain of your health team? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan, and uh, where I learned when you fight the Borg, you rotate your phasers. And traditionally, we have Captain Kirk, we have Captain Picard, Captain Janeway. Uh, now we have Captain Yu. Uh, so we, we want to be your first mates. Um, that's myself, and that's Dr. George Wong over there, who's, uh, who's going to tell you about a, a, a clinical trial, which I think is a game changer. Um, and... Uh, and uh, and I, I think one of the things is that the role of bariatric surgery and whether or not this is right for you or not, whether or not you want to participate in this project or not, uh, we're going to talk about this. So uh, uh, we're moving from the, you know, the, the 1920s to the new century of uh, how to manage your weight better. I can't think of uh, a better introduction to Dr. George Wong, who's uh, um, a colleague, a friend, and someone who's really thinking hard about how to you can improve your weight. George? Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, it's, of course, it's uh, great to, um, to be here. And thank you for asking me, uh, or thank you for uh, the opportunity to come and, uh, and of course, talk about the study and, and, and see the great things that you're doing for your patients. Uh, is the next slide for me, or? or well, I guess we're talking about one, one, one more story. So to me, um, um, 
this gentleman uh, has lost a lot of weight, um, uh, and he has a good dog. <laughs> and I think you know is that so. Um, to me, is that how do you find solutions along the way? Um, and there are solutions, and so um, and they can be fun solutions. So uh, is that I'm thinking is that uh, get a dog, get a cat, get a get a get a do, do something. You know, um, develop a friendship at work. Um, do lots of things. Uh, join the boot camp with uh, Emily if you want, um, and um, and or, or, or just do something. Okay, I forgot about that. That's a wonderful picture, and uh, uh, Gary's wonderful, and uh, his dog's wonderful, and he, he's made some some wonderful changes, and uh, he's kind enough to share his story. Next slide, please. Yep. So just like Gary made changes and communicated with his healthcare team, we strongly encourage you to also discuss realistic weight loss expectations and sustainable goals with Dr. Kernew. And in order to accomplish this goal, healthcare providers can help you and other patients as well redefine success as healthy behavioral changes. And it also may be beneficial to discuss personal struggles with regards to weight loss, if there are any. Um, next slide. Yep, so Obesity Canada also illustrates a need to advocate for more effective care for people with obesity. And this is needed because there are many barriers that affect access to obesity care in Canada. We mentioned Ozempic and other drugs and how they're really expensive, um, and no anti-obesity medications are covered under any provincial public drug benefit or pharmacy program. And also patients can wait up to eight years before meeting specialists as well. So these are just some of the barriers in the healthcare system that, um, that we are looking to overcome. Next slide. Yep, you're good. Oh, there, oh yeah, there we go. And Stephanie will be talking a little bit about challenges. Alrighty, so now we're going to be talking about uh, why it is so hard to lose weight. Uh, it's probably a question that most of us have asked ourselves on multiple occasions. Uh, and the reality of it is that it's uh, dozens of factors, both big and small. Uh, and it's unrealistic to pinpoint a single uh, factor as the sole culprit. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, I've simplified some of the most common sources of obstacles that tend to jeopardize an individuals um, who are kind of on their weight loss journey, I guess you could call it. Uh, so first we've got physical barriers. So something as seemingly simple as a lack of sleep, uh, poor eating habits, or maybe something as complex as a medical diagnosis. Uh, either way, these tend to be very persuasive motives uh, for people to kind of fall out of their diet or uh, like not being as willing to work out, uh, and they simply eliminate uh, your motivation. And then we've got environmental barriers. So who and what you surround yourself with. Uh, you know, positivity and support from those around you, they can have a huge impact on your motivation. And it's not just limited to how people respond to your goals, but uh, also whether or not they have healthy habits. Uh, so, for example, one of my goals for the summer was to uh, get a hold of my sleeping schedule, you know, be in bed by 12 and uh, wake up refreshed with an early start to my days. Uh, and fortunately, most of my friends like to uh, start movie marathons around 12. And so I ha kind of had this barrier in which I wanted to spend time with my friends, but it also directly implicated the goals that I had planned for my well-being. Uh, so yeah, so I'll just add on that environmental barriers can also be situational. So for example, if uh, you don't think you have the time in your schedule to cook the healthy meals that you want to, or not being in the financial position uh, to purchase gym equipment or maybe a membership. And then the final challenge is often the most difficult to overcome because it all happens in your head. So mental or emotional barriers such as stress, feeling overwhelmed or helpless, not knowing where to start, uh, these all contribute to a loss of that initial motivation that we often get uh, when we're inspired to change our lifestyle habits. Insecurities even can get in our way despite being the very reason we might have been motivated in the first place. So a very common dilemma that might resonate with you is gym intimidation. So maybe getting into your own head, thinking that you'll look out of place as a newbie uh, or that you're doing something wrong compared to the 
I guess, buff and broad gym bods that tend to heighten your self-critique because you feel intimidated by them. All right, so now on to the next slide. Uh, I've summarized some of our strengths and weaknesses. Next slide, please. I think Sorry, I think my internet connection might be bad, so maybe it didn't update for me. So, uh, so you know, we're different technologies. I'll be quiet. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, it updated. <laughs> So um, onto this next slide, I've summarized some of our strengths and weaknesses that people tend to have throughout the entirety of their weight loss journey. Yeah. Uh, and I think that they are important to keep in mind uh, like during the entire process. Uh, so in remembering your strengths, um, you're constantly reminded uh, of the inspiration and the motivated state that you were first in, uh, and it's often characterized by um, the self-awareness that you want to make a change uh, and to develop a better or more mature uh, version of yourself. Right. So then as for weaknesses, some common ones include having difficulty sustaining this sudden burst of motivation, whether it's because you have unrealistic standards or maybe you're not going about it the right way, um, because some people often focus solely on diet or maybe solely on exercise, uh, or maybe you have a ride or die attitude in which you think, I'm not going to make a single mistake, I'm not going to stray from my plans whatsoever, uh, in which case the problem is that your methods uh, just aren't compatible for your long-term goals, and you might feel as though they're effective, but that's only in the short-term period. Okay, so some strategies to overcoming these uh, barriers are on the next slide. Uh, and re when referencing the three categories of challenges that I mentioned, um, some strategies include number one, being able to take care of your body in order to minimize those physical barriers. So putting the simple stuff first, so maybe before you start out your workout plan, it might be more beneficial to really refine any detrimental habits so that you're slowly working your way in and you're not um, exhausting your body all of a sudden. So just getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, uh, maybe replacing your snacks with healthier options. It's all about kind of gauging what your body can take physically uh, and prioritizing it. And then for the environmental barriers, you want to surround yourself with, one, people who you can openly communicate your goals with, maybe express any insecurities or any of your underlying motivations, um, and two, people who will respond with positivity, love, and support. Um, maybe they will offer you help. So, for example, if you're too intimidated to go to the gym alone, uh, you can ask a friend to show you a few things or to maybe become your gym buddy. Uh, and in general, communication will really allow your support system to help push and accelerate you towards your goals, which is a lot more manageable than getting through it alone. Right. And then for our mental barriers, we've got starting small and recording your progress as well as your failures. So in starting small, you avoid the feeling of becoming overwhelmed. And in setting achievable goals, it's likely that with every success you gain, your motivation is also going to persist and grow. So maybe that's going for a 30-minute walk every day rather than watching another episode of your favorite show. Uh, and it's good to record your progress because you can visually see what you've done and your efforts. Uh, and it helps us uh, out of feeling stagnant, so maybe when you don't see a difference in the mirror or on the scale. The same line of thought kind of applies to your failures uh, because in identifying and mapping out what, where you think you've fallen short, it can help you identify your obstacles and plan against them, uh, as well as come to terms with clearer goals for your future. Um, this is especially important for the ride or die attitude that I mentioned before, in which if you want to go in 100% all at once without making a single mistake, recording your successes and failures will really help you realize that Mistakes are just that. They're mistakes that can be overcome and solved. And in recognizing this, you'll learn to become less hard on yourself. Okay, so on the next slide, I thought I would briefly recall the portfolio diet covered more thoroughly in the Living with High Cholesterol webinar that's linked there. 
Uh, and basically, Dr. David Jenkins at UFT developed this diet that focused more so on what you can eat and its combinations rather than uh, what you have to avoid. And it's a pretty simple example of how changing your perspective can really ease the process uh, and help you overcome the difficulties you might face when attempting to lose weight. Um, so on the next slide, we can see that obesity is a major cause of many illnesses and deaths, having been associated as a key risk factor for um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, depression, uh, and recently COVID-19. Uh, and the British Medical Journal outlined that with increased research on COVID-19 prevention, the notion that weight loss and dietary change can prevent uh, or even reverse these illnesses is becoming more widely acknowledged and researched. In fact, on the next slide, uh, we can see the basic food guide to what type 2 diabetes trialists were following in a study that concluded that diets with uh, diets that highlighted more whole grains, fruits and legumes, uh, and less red meats, refined carbs, and processed foods uh, demonstrated a reduced need for drug treatment, reduced inflammation, and enhanced microbiome of the gut, as well as improved uh, the well-being and mental health of the trialists. So overall, the simple conclusion is that what you eat really does matter. And then I believe the next slide is about Dr. Kearney's personal barrier, which uh, he did mention a bit in the previous slides. If you'd like to take that on. So, can you hear me? All right. So, um, to me, is that I love eating. I'm always hungry. I'm a nighttime eater. I, I haven't solved that problem totally. So, one of the things I overcome my nighttime eating is by exercising a lot. Um, you mentioned um, eight hours sleep, but I think I average four point something hours. Um, I seem to function at, at that level. Um, and the thing that really helps me is that if the ability to try to make a difference to, to, to is, is what the, the goal is today right now. So um, I learned from my dad, never give up and don't be afraid to make mistakes. So the, the message here is, as, as you point out, Stephanie and others, is that uh, a learning process is, I'm not sure mistakes, it's just just um, lumps along the way and just move forward from this. And um, um, I'm a super type A personality, but I'm, I'm trying to develop uh, some sort of softness. So you'll see me get angry. And the reason I get angry is because I care. Um, and I, I want the best for you. And uh, and, and, and for that is, you know, you have to find things that are important. So one of the goals I set is I want to learn how to kite surf. And I've been trying for a number of years. I, I, I can get up for about 30 seconds here and there. And uh, I'm going to do that. I'm having fun learning. And, uh, um, and you know, if for some people it's just, you know, um, going for walks with their dogs and just going outside a little bit. So please try and don't be afraid to not be successful. But don't be afraid to try. That's all. That's all I have to say. Next slide. Nice. Okay. So now we'll be talking a little bit about psychological factors, and they play a huge role in obesity. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah. So when you struggle with mental health, negative thinking, and low self worth, those mental patterns can develop into anxiety and depression. And being anxious and depressed often contributes to overeating, which can lead to obesity. And of course, being obese can exacerbate poor body image, low self-esteem, which both contribute to depression and anxiety. So therefore, obesity and psych psychological factors, they're linked together in this positive feedback loop. Next slide. Yeah. So psychological factors that contribute to obesity can be rooted in negative childhood experiences. And as I explain these connections, think about which ones apply to you. So first we have something called food script. Each family will have its own patterns and culture around eating. And as children, we internalize these patterns until they form our relationships with food. And when we become adults, we may find it very challenging to change our eating patterns because they've become habitual over so many years. That's why it might be really hard to stick to a diet, for example. Next so, slide. So okay. I, put, I put this here, uh, one resource that, that I, called Registered Dietitians. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a number, there's an Ontario uh, uh, 
under, undertaking where you can actually speak or email a dietitian in Ontario at no cost. Um, I think it's a wonderful resource, um, and I, I just put that number there, so uh, that's something people can think about, because we, you know, most of us eat about 10 foods, um, we don't modify our eating habits too much, and you know, how do we eat a healthy pizza, as uh, I learned from Chad and others, and I thank my wife for making, uh, making that effort to, to, to help me, when she's helped me a lot on my plant-based eatings, and yeah, I fall off the wagon a lot, but um, I... Uh, Use resources, and one is that uh, don't be afraid to ask others. And here's one: is the the Dietitians of Ontario, wonderful resource available to you. Um, next, next mm -hmm. slide. Alrighty. So, secondly, discipline is of course necessary in childhood. But if you were raised with too much discipline and control, you might have felt suffocated with too many rigid and inflexible rules. And this can lead to emotional eating, which is when people rely on food to feel comfort and happiness. So going on strict diets can be ineffective because there's an emotional attachment towards the food that's rooted in your negative childhood experiences. Next slide. Our earliest experiences of our body can also affect um, our perceptions of ourselves. And if you were name called by others, bullied by other kids, or otherwise made to feel embarrassed about your body, then you'll likely have an unhealthy or poor body image. And obesity or being overweight might become a label that defines your identity. And for some, this label can create barriers in your relationships and act as a certain form of protection, like a defense mechanism. And losing weight comes into conflict with this identity, which is why eating healthy and exercising regularly can be very challenging. And on the next slide, there's some tips on overcoming a poor body image. So first, you can keep a top 10 list of things that you like about yourself. And these things can be things that aren't related to how much you weigh or what you look like. Um, read the list often and add to it as needed. And secondly, if you're unhappy with your weight or your body, try making practical, healthy changes to your life. Try the 30-day challenge that we just talked about or try keeping a food diary. Just try something because when we make one small practical change, we realize that the state of our body is actually within our control. So making progress and seeing a visible change in your body weight will encourage you. And finally, surround yourself with positivity. It's a lot easier to feel good about yourself when you're around supportive people. Next slide. So finally, if neglect, trauma, or abuse was part of your childhood, you may have body image issues today. And childhood neglect is defined as a failure by a child's parent to meet the child's physical, emotional, educational, or medical needs. Trauma includes any life event that destabilizes us, like the death of a loved one or a major accident. And finally, abuse can come in many different forms, like physical, psychological, sexual, or emotional. And neglect, trauma, and abuse can lead to feelings of emptiness, grief, and repressed emotions. And food can temporarily solve all of those problems, bringing short-term joy and feelings of safety. So if you have been abused, neglected, or traumatized, please reach out to your GP or a psychiatrist for further support and care. And there's also um, a couple of hotlines and numbers that we've put in the slides as well as additional resources. So I find the, uh, uh, the alcohol gambling and drug number that was provided here, wonderful resources. Look, I'm not a psychiatrist. I know how difficult it is and you have experts. I'm a good heart doctor and I want to help you at your heart. If you have emotional issues that you feel that are important, talk to your family doctor. Um, and also, uh, this number here is confidential people that are really good people that will help you. They'll, they'll take care of you. They'll help in a non-judgmental non way. Uh, so to me, I see a big problem with, you know, from, from drugs to, to alcohol. Um, and to me, as you mentioned, that food can be a partial solution, but it also can be a real enemy as well. Same thing with these other problems as well. So reach out to the experts in this area. And here's... Uh, one contact bit of information, but your family doctor is a wonderful resource uh, as well. And uh, if you need help, get the help you need. There are people that want to help. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, there we go. And now Zoya will be talking a little bit more about nighttime eating. That's my downfall. Smart goals. Um, the things that are listed on this slide might be applicable to some of everyone's goals. 
Um, if we look at the first one here, nighttime snacking, that can definitely be an obstacle for some. Uh, just some strategies that I've come across that might seem to be a little bit more helpful in this area is drinking lots of water before bed to feel full, um, brushing your teeth after your last meal so you're not tempted um, to eat another meal afterwards. Um, and I think, as mentioned in a couple of our other webinars before, um, in terms of smart grocery shopping, kind of knowing which aisles to avoid in the grocery store, like the middle ones that have um, usually tend to have most of our unhealthy snacks, and kind of just not purchasing them so they're not in our home, so we're not really able to access them late at night if we're, if we're getting a craving. Um, as well, um, if too many calories in a day, if consuming too many calories in a day is an issue, um, definitely I would recommend keeping kind of like a food diary or a log so you can see um, over the span of a week or a month which uh, foods are being repeated in your diet that tend to be high calorie and kind of just work on swapping those out with lower calorie meals and spacing your, your meals throughout the day. And then as well to tackle things like fast food consumption, meal prepping is always a really good thing to do on the weekends. Um, soups are a really good um, low calorie and cheaper option to make and you can make your own broths at home, at home as well using um, vegetable scraps and such and they store really nicely in the fridge so that's something else to consider as well um, that's on the lower calorie side and then in terms of reducing your sugar intake as well definitely making smarter choices in the grocery store avoid buying um, things that are processed Highly processed foods have a strong link to things like cancer and obesity, so we want to try and make as much of the food as we can at home. Next slide. Oh, um, yeah, okay, there we go. So now that we understand the link between childhood experiences, psychological factors, and obesity, and we've talked about nighttime eating, let's look at some more practical solutions. So the strategy that we're going to discuss is something called mindful eating. You could go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so mindfulness, it means focusing on the present moment while calmly accepting your feelings and thoughts rather than reacting to your emotions. So there's a difference between acceptance versus reaction. And we want to focus on the overall experience of eating our food and we want to pay attention to how we feel, both mentally and physically, as we consume food. Next slide. So there are real benefits to mindful eating, and several studies have shown that mindful eating can help with weight loss and it can also prevent overeating. A study conducted by researchers at Indiana State and Duke University investigated mindful eating techniques for the treatment of binge eating specifically. And this was a randomized controlled trial, which is very high quality evidence. The study had 150 participants, and it compared a mindfulness-based therapy to a standard psychoeducational treatment, and it also, of course, included a control group. And both of the treatments, the mindfulness and the psychoeducational interventions, led to declines in binge eating and depression. But the mindfulness-based therapy had additional benefits. It helped people enjoy their food more, struggle less with controlling their eating, and recognize the difference between emotional and physical hunger. Um, and if you could go to the next slide. Yeah, so now that we know what mindful eating is and the real benefits that, can, that it can have on people's lives, I'm going to be demonstrating what mindful eating actually looks like as I eat this orange. And if you'd like, feel free to grab a snack and follow along eight steps of mindful eating while I eat my orange. So if you could go to the next slide, the first step of mindful eating is to begin with your shopping list. Um, also, yeah, okay, so here's the orange, but I'm going to put this aside for now. First, you want to consider the nutritional value of every single item that you put in your shopping cart and really try your best to avoid impulse buying when you're shopping. Try not to slip in that bag of chips or that box of Oreos. And two ways to do this is, one, don't shop when you're hungry because you're going to want to eat the entire snack aisle. And two, create a shopping list before you go to the grocery store so that you know exactly what you're going to get and what you need to buy. And Zoya also mentioned staying um, on the edges of the grocery store, so trying not to go into those middle aisles because that's where all the pop is, the chips are, and you want to avoid that. Um, next slide. So the second step is to come to the table with an appetite, but not when you're super hungry and starving. 
And before you eat, you ideally, you want to be hungry, but not starving because if you skip meals, you might be so eager to get anything and everything in your stomach that your first priority will be filling your stomach instead of enjoying the food. Next slide. And the third step is to start with a small portion. Limit the portions of food that you consume. And one really simple way to do this is to just use a smaller plate. Um, on the picture there, you can see that the same amount of food on both plates, but on the smaller plate, it looks like you're eating a lot more because the, pl the plate is smaller and because the food fills up most of the plate. And on the next slide, we're going to be talking about the fourth step of the mindful eating practice, which is to um, appreciate your food and express gratitude. So before you eat, pause for a second to contemplate everything and everyone it took to bring the food to your table. And if I'm looking at this tangerine, I'm thinking about where it was grown, probably in Arizona or California or Florida or something, and it had to be shipped all the way from a different country to Canada. And I'm grateful for this tangerine because it's provided me with really important nutrients and vitamins, and I'm grateful that I live in a country like Canada where tangerines are readily available. And I'm thankful that I get to eat this snack with all of you, with the patients at clinic, with Dr. Kearney, with all of our volunteers, um, with Dr. Wong as well. And this is an amazing opportunity to learn more about mindful eating. Um, and on the next slide, I talk about bringing all your senses to the meal. So when you're eating your food, be attentive to the color, um, the texture, and the aroma of your food. And for this tangerine, as you can see, it's orange in color. The pith of the tangerine, the white veiny stuff, it makes the tangerine a bit rough to the touch. And the tangerine doesn't really smell like anything, but maybe if I had to name a scent, it's mildly citrusy. And um, if I eat the tangerine, there's a lot of water. Con there's a lot of water content in the tangerine as well. So those are just some observations and some ways that you can practice mindful eating. Um, and if you're eating a snack with multiple ingredients, try identifying all those ingredients, especially the seasonings. Um, this might seem strange to you, identifying all these details, but really what we're trying to do is cultivate an awareness of the food that you're eating so that you can focus on the present moment. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the sixth step is to take small bites. It's easier to taste food when your mouth isn't full so try putting your utensil down between bites. And in terms of this orange, um, if I'm in a rush, sometimes I'll just peel the orange in half and then shove the half of my orange into, the, my, into my mouth and just gobble it down really quickly. But really try to savor the food that you're eating by taking smaller bites. So actually peel, like take apart the orange and put a slice in your mouth instead. And this will make the food last longer and make the eating experience more enjoyable as well. And second to last step, the seventh step, is to chew thoroughly on the next slide. Oh, yeah, there we go. So chew really well until you can taste the essence of the food. And you might have to chew 20 to 40 times. And you might be really surprised by all the flavors that are released. I was eating a tangerine this morning, actually, and thinking about this webinar. And the tangerine almost tasted like a lychee to me a little bit. So... And that's not something that I've ever noticed before. And that was because I was actually paying attention to the flavors and the way that my food tasted. And on the next slide, um, the final step is to eat slowly. And this comes hand in hand with chewing thoroughly. It will prevent you from overeating. And that's it. That's what mindful eating looks like. Beautiful. <laughs> Perfect. Anyway, I'd like to uh, again introduce myself. I'm Jorge Wong. I'm a, I'm a colleague of uh, Greg's um, and a friend. And uh, again, I'm very grateful uh, to be here uh, discussing uh, this interesting, exciting new, new study uh, of weight loss to improve heart health. And of course, also want to congratulate you, Greg, and your students. You've done a great job. Uh, I think putting uh, this this webinar together, um, very comprehensive approach to weight and weight management starting you know understanding the link between the heart and weight and all sorts of aspects including medical therapy behavioral therapy cbd very 
very comprehensive. I think you guys have done a great job. Okay, uh, maybe we'll just go to the next slide. So what is BRAVE? And uh, BRAVE, oh, yeah, so um, BRAVE essentially is, we are looking at ways to improve uh, heart health by uh, by weight reduction, essentially. And a lot of, you've learned a lot today uh, during the webinar, and one of the key things that we don't really know yet is whether if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stroke, if something has happened to your heart and you're already severely overweight, will losing weight, will that, is that going to help you? Uh, a lot of the studies that, uh, that Greg and his team has discussed is in individuals that are overweight uh, but healthy, never have, who haven't had heart attacks, and definitely in people who have lo that lose weight uh, and hypertension can melt away, diabetes can melt away, sleep apnea can melt away, but and that will likely prevent future strokes and heart attacks if you haven't had any heart conditions. But once your heart condition is established, nobody really knows whether weight loss uh, is going to help. I mean, it makes sense that it is going to help. Uh, logically, it makes sense that it's going to help, but studies really just have not been done in this area, and that's what BRAVE is coming uh, in here. Uh, maybe if you go to the next slide. Perfect. So, so what is what is the, the, the main question of the study? And, and what we're really looking at is we're looking at two weight, strategy, weight loss strategies. We're looking at bariatric surgery, so a procedure that... Uh, We'll, we'll get to in, in the next few slides, but but involves uh, making the stomach size smaller and changing some of the absorption of nutrients that you eat. Uh, and what we call medical weight management, or essentially a team-based approach on weight loss, which involves dietitians, nurses, metabolic physicians, um, and other experts that will help you um, oversee uh, your own weight loss, sort of like that Star Trek slide that uh, was shown earlier, that you are sort of uh, the captain of your weight loss, but we are, you're, you're um, assisted by a team. And I actually really like that, uh, that uh, picture, by the way. Uh, maybe if you just go to the next slide. So who can participate in this study? And that really alludes to a lot of what was mentioned earlier with regards to BMI, uh, to have their, to be eligible for bariatric surgery in Ontario or even in, 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 in North America, uh, BMI has to be greater than 35 uh, or equal to, greater or equal to 35 kil kilograms per meter squared. And you have to have uh, some form of um, cardiovascular complications, so previous heart attack, uh, previous uh, stroke, for example, atrial fibrillation, which is a very common rhythm disorder that I look after in individuals uh, that are severely overweight, or who have had previous um, um, bypass surgery or cor um, coronary vascularization. So who is who should not participate in the study? But those are mainly individuals that, uh, that are, um, again, uh, typically if not, uh, um, not great candidates for bariatric surgery mainly. So individuals uh, who have a recent diagnosis of cancer, for example, or have had significant abdominal surgery, uh, or if you've had a heart attack, for example, in the, next, in the last 90 days. But the vast majority of individuals uh, is, we're trying to be very inclusive here, look at a lot of heart uh, patients with a lot of different cardiac conditions um, uh, who can actually participate uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Well, one of the last, one of, before we move to the next slide, I guess one thing that I do want to mention is it is important to know that uh, bariatric surgery is typically not uh, offered readily to individuals who have had previous heart history. And the reason for that is that um, I believe it's just a, a bit of a misconception. A lot of the bariatric surgeons don't, um, don't, um, don't offer it likely because they feel that potentially this may put patients at, at more at elevated risk of complications from the surgery. But smaller studies do show that actually there is no such increased risk 
and the sort of the the benefit might far away the reward in patients with cardiac, cardiac history, uh, and then that is the reason why we're doing this study as well. So why don't we go to the next uh, slide? Um, so this is sort of the nuts and bolts of how the study uh, is um, organized. So in, in the individuals who are severely overweight, so BMI greater than or equal to 35, uh, and who have what we call high-risk cardiovascular or heart disease, so uh, individuals who had a previous stroke, heart attack, uh, who have had previous uh, bypass surgery, who have atrial fibrillation, uh, for instance, uh, and who are on uh, what we call not a good medical therapy for their condition, and that they have no um, contraindications to bariatric surgery, so mainly basically that they don't have a condition that prevents them from having bariatric surgery normally. So these individuals are, uh, would, if they decide to participate in the study, uh, they are at this point randomized. And what does randomization mean is, it mean, immediately means it's almost like a flip of a coin. Uh, there's a 50% chance that individuals uh, get bariatric surgery and 50% chance individuals get the medical weight management. And we're going to compare these two different strategies to weight loss. Um, and uh, we're going to be then after, after we're going to be following them intervals. And again, then we're going to try to see if there's been an improvement or decrease in number of strokes, uh, number of uh, deaths, number of heart attacks, uh, quality of life, um, and all these things we're going to be looking at and try to see if one is better than another approach. Uh, we are going currently we are uh, doing this study out of two centers uh, here McMaster and Ottawa expanding to a couple of other centers Kingston and um, and London in the near future and hopefully again this is quite the revolutionary study because if we could actually help individuals uh, uh, lose weight and improve their health and show that actually prolongs life, this will revolutionize the care of um, severely overweight patients with heart conditions. So why don't we go to the next uh, slide. So what is medical weight management in the study? And it, it, uh, it has several components that uh, uh, Greg's team has already discussed, but basically uh, it includes, number one, um, the team approach. So what does that mean? There's a dietitian involved, there is a weight loss physician involved, nurses, social workers, individuals uh, that, uh, kinesiologists, individuals that will help you understand nutrition, um, uh, how to best do physical activities, how to manage your weight, and also, uh, and this will be delivered in a series of sessions that, that are weekly to bi-weekly, lasting about an hour to an hour and a half for the first six months. Then the meetings slow down to every two to four weeks for the next six months, and then they continue uh, every three months. Um, a, uh, the first 12 weeks of the, of the program involves a very low calorie meal replacement. Um, Optifast is the medication or the, the meal replacement is often used. It's about a 250 calorie per, um, uh, per it's, it's essentially a shake. So it's a 250 calorie shake over, so, uh, and then initially it replaces all of your, will replace all of the, all of the individual's meals there. So it'll be, be about a thousand calories uh, per day uh, in addition to uh, everything um, that's meant to. Uh, during the study, some of the medications that, uh, that, uh, Greg's team mentioned as well, such as Exenda and Contrave, uh, may be used. And I see Ari joins. So Ari, Ari is one of the bariatric surgeons and, and leader with me of the study. Uh, and actually, very good timing, Ari, because we I think we're getting to the bariatric surgery portion of this. And maybe you can, when we get there, uh, we'll we'll need your expertise. So why don't we go to the next? Uh, oh, just pause for a second here. Just go back one. So, yep. this medical therapy is an intervention. Sorry, just have to hear for a second. Sorry, can we hear some echoing? Medical therapy is an hour to an hour and a half every week. So, we have to make some more part of it. 
is actually really important. So to me, is that if you want to do a threat, you got to work hard at it. You get the. Sir, it's it's, it's very faint for me, Greg. I don't know, but uh, I, I'm hearing. Okay, that's better. So you need a lot of help. There. And you need to do something for 60 to 90 minutes almost every week for six months. And so that's a big commitment, and it's the right commitment. So if you go to a research project or not, best medical therapy is hard work which, is, which supports almost every week. Uh, and that's important to, to, to realize is that no wonder most of us don't lose weight because we're not working to the, to the best of our abilities with the right team approach. So this is something actually really important to think about. What is your team going to be? It doesn't have to be through necessarily through a trial, but your best teamwork needs to involve a lot of other individuals, lots of supports, and a lot of hard work on your part to make that work. Does that make sense to people to, to think about this? And so the trial is trying to give the best medical therapy, the best team approach. Now, whether um, so, what clinical trials do is try to give you the best care possible, the best medical care versus the best surgical care. Um, so think about in your world, if you want to lose weight, what you need to do. And you're the captain of your team, and but you need to look at this. So we, we've offered people lots of supports. We'll call you every week. People drop off very quickly. Um, and so how to, how, to, how to get to there. Um, and that's really, really important to, to look at that. Um, so I think this is actually very key to me is that uh, this is something you need to think about in your weight loss journey. What's your thoughts about that, George? Uh, no, I, th I think you're, you're right on it. I mean, uh, I, I, like you mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know, everything takes effort, uh, and it's not, you know, uh, weight loss is not going to be, it's not a magical thing that just happens. So you do definitely have to be committed. And but we hope that with this approach, with people so providing all sorts of support, um, as well as a degree of structure, that uh, people will be able to achieve these goals in their weight loss journey. That medical therapy is fantastic. This is this is a super. This is this is a, this is the the dream team of uh, supports. Thank you for putting that together. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the comment. Uh, let's go to the next. So, um, in with regards to bariatric surgery, so so I'm hearing some echoing here. But uh, what will what will happen is essentially uh, the other arm is uh, consists of bariatric surgery. Um, and typically, you know, from the time that people are referred to participate in the study uh, to that coin, so, so that uh, coin flip step, to the randomization step, so the, the bariatric surgery would then be performed approximately 30 days after that. So the weight is approximated to be around probably three to four months from the time uh, the patients are referred. And this is in contrast with the typical time that can take for bariatric surgery, uh, which can be a year or two. Um, the, the procedure, I mean, and I'll let Ari explain in the next slide a bit, uh, in a bit more detail, but it's, it's essentially a minimally invasive procedure, uh, which we call laparoscopic or keyhole surgery, essentially uh, small incisions made on the, uh, on the uh, abdom abdominal wall uh, to access uh, um, the abdominal cavity. Um, and essentially, um, in bariatric surgery, uh, it is the uh, uh, best known method uh, to date to, uh, it, to attain significant weight loss and weight loss that, that basically stays. So that is why we're using this as a, a comparison to um, 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 medical therapy. Um, let me, maybe if we go to the next slide, maybe Ari can give some more, flesh out some more details about uh, the, about bariatric surgery. Let's see the next slide, or you could, you're free to write. Yeah, so no problem. Can you guys hear me okay? Great, okay. So yeah, bariatric surgery um, would be the other arm of this trial, specifically uh, for this trial, we'll be using a sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, the reason for that is um, it's a technically an easier procedure, and overall, it's uh, uh, we think in this population, it's a quicker procedure, so a slightly lower per uh, perioperative risk uh, than the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, although the Roux-en-Y is very good, and it's actually the more common procedure that we perform. Um, but for this study, we'll be doing the sleeve gastrectomy. 
As you can see in that slide, the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, as Jorge said, every surgery we do is laparoscopic, so it's through uh, four small ports, so you have very, very little scars uh, uh, on the belly after. And uh, what we do in this procedure is we take out uh, part of the stomach and we make your stomach more of a tube. And this works in a number of ways. Um, there's a bit of, uh, first of all, there's a bit of restriction when you eat, so you can't kind of eat as much and take in as much. The other thing is the food has nowhere to kind of be stored, it kind of, so it's quickly transferred through the stomach, which is uh, which is not normal. Oftentimes, food stays in the stomach. And then uh, the third mechanism um, is that the uh, stomach produces a, a, a lot of a hormone called ghrelin, which suppresses appetite. And so, taking out part of the uh, or which stimulates appetite. Sorry. So, uh, so by taking out the stomach, you stop the ghrelin from uh, being secreted, so your ghrelin levels are lower. So, um, overall, it's a very, it's the most common procedure on Earth, actually. So, only in Ontario and very few jurisdictions do we do bypass more. Um, so, it's a very common procedure, very successful procedure. How long does it typically take to this procedure, Ari? So, it typically would take around 40 to 50 minutes of operative time. And usually patients are in hospital for a night or two. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and what, what happens to, I know a lot of patients that have high blood pressure or diabetes, it seems like their diabetic drugs uh, or high blood pressure drugs quickly come off soon after that. Just, it's dramatic sometimes, some of the changes we see, even without, even without the weight loss, we start seeing improvements in diabetes and high blood pressure almost immediately. Yeah, so definitely this is, uh, these have, uh, it's, and bariatric surgery has always been thought of a weight loss procedure, but in fact, uh, many of its benefits go beyond that, and usually for mechanisms that are uh, independent of weight loss specifically. So as, as Jorge said, uh, two of the biggest ones in this, uh, two of the biggest ones for a lot of patients beyond just weight loss, which is a big one, are, are diabetes uh, remission, and so about 50 to 60 percent of patients are in remission of their diabetes, so i.e. they have controlled blood sugars without medications uh, up to 12 years after. So it's a very it's very successful for that, and uh, this also extends to cardiovascular risk factors in uh, randomized trials. So things like hypertension and uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, and which lends itself to why this trial we'd like to start because no no randomized trial has looked at. I'm sure Jorge's discussed this. Uh, specific cardiovascular outcomes. They've just looked at cardiovascular risk factors, which are lowered, but it hasn't uh, exactly translated to lower cardiovascular risk factors just because those studies weren't powered uh, to do so. And they weren't in populations with people who are a bit maybe heightened uh, cardiovascular risk. Great, absolutely. What's the expected weight reduction you'll see? So it's a good question. Um, obviously, results may vary. But the uh, <laughs> but the uh, average weight loss for people is around twenty five to thirty percent of total body weight. So in that, it takes about a year to a year and a half to plateau. So for someone who weighs, for example, you know, three hundred pounds, we would expect that they lose somewhere between kind of seventy five and you know one hundred and one hundred and ten pounds would be pretty average uh, for that. Um, and then there's there's a million different measures, but that's probably about 25 to 30 percent of total body weight would be a pretty standard uh, weight loss metric or expectation. What what patients don't do well with surgery? What percentage won't lose meaningful weight, and what percent of patients will regain their weight or come to the weight by five years? So, that's a good question. So uh, about I would, so for so those are, those are kind of two different study two different study phenomena uh, phenomena. So. For insufficient weight loss, that's probably only about 5% of patients or less. So very few patients, and, and for us, insuffi so insufficient weight loss in a medical trial would be like 5 pounds. For us, we've set the bar a bit higher, and it's around 10, different studies will say different things, but it's, it's probably about 10 to 15% of your body weight. So if you don't lose 10 to 15% of your body weight, we consider that a insufficient weight loss. Um, and let's just say the number is 10%. So that would be more like someone who's 300 pounds. So someone who loses, let's say if you don't, you only lose 30 or 40, we would consider that insufficient weight loss. About 15% of patients have excessive weight gain, weight regain over time. And it, and this is a function of not, uh, it's a function of 
also just time from the procedure. So, uh, you know, as you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years pass for some patients, uh, weight regain can occur. Oftentimes, this is related to some other impactful event in their lives, uh, job losses or, you know, deaths in the family, mourning, things of this nature. Um, however, they de definitely do happen without those uh, things occurring. Um, but, and that's about 10 to 15 percent of patients over the long term will regain more. And what we consider weight regain is uh, more than 10 percent of the weight you, you've lost. So in other words, if you've lost 100 pounds, you regain more than about 10 or 15 pounds. We consider that in like uh, uh, extensive weight regain. So then we would look at different things and try to try to nip that in the bud uh, at the time when, when it happens. So what happens to a person who says, I love food, I love going out to eat, and uh, so they go to the cave, so they go to the restaurant, what things do you like? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a good question. So for sure, they're very, in our system, they're highly counseled as to what to expect after the procedure. Um, for both procedures, maybe bypass a bit more, you're functionally restricted from eating that much, literally. And uh, for a lot of patients, this brings about a very long-term uh basically change in habit in their eating habits. In other words, uh, if you've had a gastric bypass, for example, or a sleeve, it's very hard to eat m more than a little bit at a time. And like anything else, as that becomes a habit, it just becomes a habit for people. So some people can, you know, regain the ability to eat more, but that's a minor once again a minority of patients. So, um, and going through the process, people should be very clear as to what the uh, expectations are and what, for kind of eating after and what they're going to be able to eat. Um, and certainly immediately post-operatively, it's uh, a lot less than they're probably eating now and in a different way, for sure. Smaller meals, more frequent, more liquids, things of this nature. And what's with dumping syndrome? So dumping syndrome was more of an issue uh, seemingly 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, we actually don't see, we do uh, six or 700 cases a year and we don't see a significant amount of dumping syndrome anymore. Um, it used to be related to the size of the anastomosis, and now we make a very small connection between the two. Dumping syndrome, just to take a step back, just so everyone's clear, dumping syndrome is where um, food gets to the middle of the intestines too quickly, especially a high sugar load. And it basically, for lack of a better term, sets off the uh, digestion chain very quickly in patients. Um, and causes things like, uh, and just, you know, causes some symptoms in that way. But it's essentially food going through you too quickly, and especially high sugary things. So to combat that, we definitely counsel patients that, you know, they don't have pop or juices or things of this nature. Those can induce dumping. And so once again, our dietitians are very good to discuss these things. But overall, if people, uh, you know, follow most of the rules that we set forth, we have a large book and uh, all these guidelines, dumping syndrome is not a... Uh, usually a big issue that we run into in terms of post-op or, or, or complaints or anything like that. Do I have to take, like, vitamins for the rest of my life and supplements? Uh, so with the sleeve, uh, so yes, for the most part, most people will have to take a multivitamin for the rest of their life, for sure, with the bypasses. Uh, with the sleeves, less so. Uh, nutritional deficiencies are a much smaller problem with sleeves. Uh, but generally things like iron, things like vitamin D, uh, are taken for the taken uh, at least for the first year after the sleeve, and then we, we can you know usually in their last or one of their last visits a year after the surgery, they can discuss with the dietitians what, where they are in their diet and uh, what they may need for the future. So it's not guaranteed that they'll need it for life, but certainly for the first year as uh, the nutritional status plateaus. So I like to have a couple of drinks every night, and I still smoke. Am I a good candidate for your operation? So, uh, so in both of those circumstances, I'd say, uh, you know, first off, first off, I think both those habits in any patient, let alone bariatric patients, it would be good to quit and cut back and and reevaluate that at any time. And I think having a big surgery like this is a great time to reevaluate uh, all of those habits: and eating habits, smoking, drinking, and all of this stuff. Um, for this specific procedure, for the sleeve, um, there's not as much of an issue around smoking, although, uh, like any procedure, if you quit, your uh, outcomes and, you know, risks around the operation are going to go way down. 
And so we would caution everyone just to stop smoking cold turkey. Um, with the, regards to drinking with this procedure, uh, we you are allowed to drink still, but probably not two or three a night, probably more like a couple a week. And uh, you'll also find that you probably, uh, the drinks get to you pretty quicker as well. So that's one of the biggest things we also talk to people about. So to get to typical bariatric surgeon on Ontario right now, the waiting list is about a, is a couple of years now? Uh, so the wait list, uh, how it said, isn't so much it's a year or a year, a year and a half. It, it takes patients generally six months to a year to go through all of the appointments that they would need. Um, and to, you know, to make sure that they're successful with the program. And then once they're done all those things, it only actually takes about four to six weeks to get the surgery. But there's uh, endoscopies, dietitian, uh, ultrasound. There's different tests that we'd like to do to optimize them to make sure that everyone has the best chance at having their surgery succeed. Um, and we also like to see, for example, uh, things like, uh, you know, if they are smoking, we'd like to see them smoke free for a couple of months. Uh, or, you know, if they have other issues going on, uh, we'd like to see things stabilized before they undergo the surgery and are in a good, you know, and are in the best place possible to get the surgery. So, um, so it's not so much a wait list as it just takes the average time it takes people to kind of go through that process to be ready for the surgery is about six months to a year. So it's quite extensive selection. So you have to be psychologically in good shape to undergo this. You have to be looking after yourself. Traditionally, you have a lot of heart surgery. You don't have to do the operation. Is that is that right? I have to have the bypass Sorry. operation. Sorry, you're just cutting out a bit. Sorry. So, if you had a bypass operation, yes, uh, would you traditionally do the operation on people? Would we? Sorry, traditionally. So, if you had if you had a bypass a year ago, would you yes. be operating on these people? Would we be operating on them without without this without the trial? Uh, so I will, so, you know, 10 years ago, no, um, more recently, you know, we are able to select certain patients, uh, depending on the, depending on what, you know, a number of circumstances, uh, patients with, you know, previous history of heart disease and extensive heart disease, they're definitely looked after more closely. And we have a specific medicine physician, uh, Dr. Deboni, who, uh, we'll see them before the surgery and, you know, make sure they're good. But, all, but you know, I would say that we are a very specialized site here. And what we do is probably not what most bariatric surgeons would do. And I would say that in the world, most bariatric surgeons wouldn't uh, operate on, on those populations routinely. And I think part of the reason for this trial is to demonstrate that we can safely do that. Um, and, you know, I think St. Joe's is one of the best places to do it because of our extensive experience and, and the, you know, resources, uh, both in human and, and human capital and clinic space and all that stuff that we have here. So what are the complications? I'm going for surgery. I weigh 300 pounds. So what, 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 what's the complications? Do I have to be on blood thinners or anything? Uh, so most people for this trial would likely have to go on blood thinners for the hospital stay and about seven, up to seven days after, um, Depending on there, we have a score called the Caprini score that looks at all these things. And depending on that score, we we suggest uh, blood thinners or not. Um, in terms of the risks, the you know we look at risks at, as short term and long term. So from a short term point of view, the risks are actually pretty reasonable and quite low. So the two major risks we look at are bleeding and infection. And by infection, we mean what's called a, something called a leak. So one of our staple lines when we cut the stomach. Uh, you know, fails to heal. The risk of either of those complications is about 1% each. And uh, the, there's a, basically there's a 1% chance of requiring an operation to address one of those things within 30 days. And I would say the overall major complication rate after a sleeve gastrectomy uh, would be somewhere in the range of kind of 3 to 4%, and minor things would be more like 5 or 6%. So um, it's, it's in the range now of like, a you know laparoscopic cholecystectomy, so something you know getting your gallbladder out or uh, hernia surgery. It's in this range at this point, and the mortality risk is almost nil uh, in the sense uh, it's probably like 0.1 percent or you know one less than one in a thousand or more like even one in you know two or three thousand at this point. So it's a pretty re you know at this point uh, 
20 years ago, bariatric surgery had a bit of a bad rap because it was done open and, you know, maybe it wasn't as uh, streamlined as it is today, but I think uh, it's, it's a very safe surgery. And I think on a population level, for sure, uh, you know, there's a net benefit to most two people. And uh, so how many operations are we doing in, in your, your center, Ontario, around Canada for year now? Sure, yeah. So uh, St. Joe specifically is the provincial lead for bariatric surgery and is actually the highest volume hospital in the country currently. Uh, we do around 750 bariatric procedures a year uh, between sleeves, uh, sleeve gastrectomies, gastric bypasses, and duodenal switches. In Ontario right now, we do around 5,500. Sorry, go. Oh, in Ontario, we do about 5,500. And across the country, we do about maybe twelve or 13,000 a year. Um, in the United States, they do somewhere more like about 10 times that number, or actually a little more, probably about 150 to 160,000 procedures every year, of which about 60% are sleeves. So in the United States alone, they do probably around eighty to 90,000 sleeve gastrectomies a year. And what's the cost of this procedure? Cost is in cost to the patient, cost of the healthcare system? Both, actually. Both. Okay. So cost to the patient, uh, you know, obviously we're a publicly funded healthcare system. So the procedure itself doesn't cost anything. You have to pay for things uh, around the procedure, though. So, you know, if you go to our campus, for example, you have to pay for parking. Um, the major uh, one is around the surgery. Most people have to take something called Optifast for two weeks before. I'm not actually sure the price of that, but it's in the range of a couple hundred bucks to get the two-week supply of it. It's a milkshake that you take kind of four times a day. It's like a NutriSure or whatever, one of these one of these uh, milkshakes that you would take for weight loss around two weeks for the procedure. And uh, so I think, you know, those would be the major costs to, the, to an individual patient uh, around this procedure. And these are discussed very upfront with all patients as to the expectations. If there are issues with money, uh, we have alternatives that don't cost as much um, and, you know, different diet, dietary plans that we can go to as well. So I wouldn't want anyone to think that you have to spend any money, really, aside from maybe some parking fees or whatnot and some gas to get to the clinic to undergo the procedure. Um, from, a healthcare pers from a healthcare perspective, uh, the hospital stay in the initial kind of... Uh, uh, a couple of nights in hospital is around six to seven thousand dollars for the procedure. So the procedure itself, with its materials, and uh, the hospital stay and all the nursing and all that stuff, is about six to seven thousand dollars. Obviously, no one pays that in our system, but that's how much it costs. And uh, there's other things like uh, people put through these balloons inside your stomach, and some of the things that were available. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's. Uh, the aspire as well, which is essentially a tube that goes in the stomach, and you just you just dump the food contents out after you eat. Which, uh, once again, um, I, I think since age immemorial, there's been uh, uh, different things for weight loss. Uh, the one you're referring to there is the intragastric balloon. It has some success, but it's certainly not a long-term solution, and maybe has a role in a very short term. Uh, a lot of people also remember lap bands, which. Um, once again, because they didn't really change your physiology, they weren't that successful. And so they were more of a very structural thing. And they worked for some people, but for many people it didn't. Uh, and once again, it didn't really change the physiology of the people. So the procedures that we have today have a physiologic impact uh, as well as, you know, a physical impact on the side of the stomach and all that stuff. And that's why I think they're more successful than things from the past. So if you're going to give advice to uh, your, uh, your, someone in your family, who should have surgery for obesity and uh, how long do you expect people to be off of work and before they're up and the ground again? Yeah, so I think, I mean, we have a recent study that just is coming out Monday, uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine, that show kind of the results of the last 10 years of the Ontario Bariatric Network. And from that, I think uh, basically anyone who meets the criteria should benefit from the surgery. So I have no question, young, old, uh, actually some of the most profound results were in men who don't normally seek the surgery. Um, and uh, people over 55 who, um, you know, once again, one of, the, one of the things that people think sometimes with the surgery is that, well, if you're 55 or 60, a lot of the, you know, damage has been done, quote unquote. And in fact, that's just not true. And, uh, you know, I think anyone of, at any age, uh, if they meet the criteria, can benefit. So I think I would suggest that anyone who meets the criteria uh, at least undergo uh, 
uh, basically, you know, at least uh, consider the procedure. In terms of uh, how long you're going to be off work and in hospital, most people go home uh, after a day or two, and they're walking around eating, and they're, you know, I would say back to 70 or 80 percent of themselves. And within a week or two, they're uh, back to kind of 90, 100 percent. And uh, the biggest change, of course, is more habitual in terms of how you're eating and, um, you know, and all the all the dietary things that come with the surgery as well, especially in the first couple of months. And people talk about depression after bariatric surgery. Tell me a little bit about and stuff. Like that. Sorry, about depression, you said? Yeah. Um, so I haven't heard too much about depression after bariatric surgery, to be honest. Um, I think, well, first of all, I would say that, you know, uh, most of the meta-analysis on these subjects would actually say that mood improves after surgery and it helps anxiety and depression. Uh, certainly, certain, you know, the only times I really hear about kind of mood, dis mood disorders of this or things of this nature or when people maybe don't get the results that they expected, certainly that can be, uh, you know, emotional for them. But obviously we have support for that. But I would say for the most part, quality of life outcomes, functional outcomes, and mental health outcomes actually improve after the surgery. This sounds like a wonderful procedure, um, but we're, we're, we're not doing as many as I guess we, as, as that could be done. What's your thoughts about how this procedure is going to evolve? But the change. Yeah, that's a good question. I it's a it's difficult to say. I mean, surgery certainly. We when we look at the numbers, only about five percent of patients who are eligible for the surgery ever really get it. So most of the patients who are eligible actually never receive the surgery. Um, and so you know, a question for the healthcare system is: Is it scalable? We do know that over time it likely does save the healthcare system money, but it is a big upfront cost, so uh, it's very hard to kind of scale that up to the numbers that we would like to see. Um, and at the same time, you know, over 50, 60, 70, 100 years, I think, uh, you know, as we study the procedures more and understand obesity and the determinants of that, you know, we may not need bariatric surgery as much or able to replicate some of its effects uh, for, you know, and, and have success in a certain subset of patients, if not all patients. I don't think we're there yet, um, and I think that uh, you know it's for the near for the near to midterm future. Uh, it's bariatric surgery is going to be a very important treatment for all patients uh, with obesity and, and comorbidities. I mean, Greg, that's why we're doing this study, right? I mean, if we actually show that bariatric surgery or just weight loss overall improve the uh, outcomes of individuals with heart conditions, then that would be a big game changer in terms of treatment of these patients. But, uh, are there any questions for anybody else? Um, are there people asking questions or comments out there? Uh, no, no, no questions at the moment. Um, any 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 thoughts from anybody else there? Um, this is this is to me what I, what I've learned is there's so many things to to, to work on being healthy and uh, surgery is sort of the the most successful of everything we have, but it's also the most uh, there's no turning back. If I, if I had the surgery, can it can it be reversed? So uh, the gastric bypass could be the sleeve gastrectomy is irreversible, so you cannot reverse it. Um, you know, we at, we physically take out a part of the stomach. So, no, that is not a reversible procedure. And um, and so, so to me, this has been a wonderful journey. Um, and uh, it's it's so, so nice to see you know from our young students to uh, superstars and, and medical working on this. Um, and. What, what, we started off with uh, a very sick patient who can only walk six steps right now, and she has a lot of comorbidities. Um, is she a candidate for the operation, uh, or, or, or not the operation, but for the, um, for the for the trial there, George? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, BMI was over 35. She has significant cardiac comorbidities. Uh, 
I don't remember all of the details from the beginning, but I didn't see any obvious contraindication to bariatric surgery. So a patient like that would be eligible to participate in the trial. And, uh, and that's exactly the, the group of individuals that we, what we think the trial or, or basically that, that we can help. Because I think uh, in the end, I mean, again, we really don't know whether, again, weight loss in individuals have had previous heart attacks, strokes, things like that will will reduce that in the future. I mean, it seems obvious and logical that it will, but that's what we want to demonstrate in the study. But I do think that weight loss uh, will definitely help these individuals. So Ari, you mentioned things like, things like certain abdominal surgery or they get endoscopy. What, te- what people are technically not able to have? Sorry, say that, sorry, say that again? So, sorry, so people that, that have previous abdominal surgery or people who have some sort of anatomy that precludes surgery? What patients do not have surgery? Um, so I would say that for the sleeve gastrectomy, there's very few patients who probably can't have a sleeve gastrectomy. The only ones that I can think of offhand would be patients who have very bad uh, reflux disease to the point where in that case, uh, we would recommend doing a gastric bypass, but otherwise a sleeve is kind of the surgery of last resort in the sense like uh, if they've already had a lot of previous surgeries, they have IBD, if they, or sorry, if they have Crohn's or colitis, for example, or other things, I think, um, you know, the sleeve is a very versatile procedure in that way and can be done on a lot of different patients. And so there's very few contraindications. And I would say that the only one that I can think of is some having something like very bad reflux disease causing Barrett's esophagus, which is a, basically a change in your esophagus because of long-standing acid, uh, acid reflux. So the sleeve, uh, it's one main complication. The sleeve is, is it is known to increase acid reflux. Um, for most people, that's not an issue. It, they remain asymptomatic. It, uh, but for a small subset of patients, it does increase it. So, um, so they can have issues. So um, with the bypass, you have more restrictions on who can have it for sure. How many different procedures are there for uh, bariatric surgery right now that you perform? That we perform in Ontario, uh, four different procedures. And I would say worldwide, you can add in maybe a, uh, a fifth procedure to that that's common. So um, essentially the sleeve gastrectomy, the ga- Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, and the duodenal switch are the three that we do most commonly in Ontario. Another one in Ontario that we do do is called a single anastomosis duodenal switch. So duodenal switch classically has two anastomoses. So another one's called a single anastomosis. It's a very similar procedure. Um, and similarly, there's another type of procedure that's done in other parts of the world called a, called a one anastomosis gastric bypass. So it's a like a gastric bypass, but you only make one connection instead of two. So um, I won't really get into the details there, but we offer, from an evidence-based perspective, we offer the three most well-studied and well-characterized and essentially the best procedures on earth. So, uh, you know, and that's because we uh, have a surgical task force that constantly reviews the literature and will make rec- recommendations to add or not add certain procedures based on the evidence. So um, I've been in practice for 30 years. I remember talking to uh, a, a gastric bypass surgery from London, Ontario. He said the people that didn't want to People who have to go off to the past uh, do well with traditional uh, bariatric surgery. What's your thoughts about um, picking the patients that benefit the most and those that benefit the least? How do you, how do you decide that? Uh, it's a good question. I wouldn't say that we have a great uh, mechanism right now to discern, you know, to pick out those patients who don't do well with it. Um, we do have, you know, we do, the patients, you know, I think will almost self-select themselves. I think, you know, like you, like we said throughout the course of this uh, discussion, I think patients who are ready to make changes work with the surgery and are kind of psychologically ready to, you know, make that big change are the patients who I think will do the best with it or have the best chance. It doesn't guarantee results, but certainly these are patients who are set up for success. I think, uh, you know, if you're not in that mindset, I think, you know, the surgery can still be successful, but I think, you know, uh, on a, if you, you know, on a population level, you know, if you take a bunch of patients who maybe aren't ready for the surgery, they, it may, they may not be as successful. So I think it's all kind of a mind frame and being ready to make those changes 
and and using kind of bariatric surgery is not as a uh, not as a you know a, something that takes the place of your own will to change, but something that will augment it greatly. I've been impressed with uh, the results of uh, so many people. Um, I've also been re- impressed with uh, results of lifestyle changes too, as well. Hmm. But I also see a lot of people who just get stuck um, and fall backwards, and I, I find this is just such a tough chronic disease. And uh, and uh, I really enjoyed the, all the discussions. Does any anybody want to add some final thoughts at all? Silent. <laughs> Um, how do we get in contact with you guys? So, oh, Jorge, you're muted there. Thank you. Sorry, I just thought maybe I was contributing to the echo that was happening. Uh, yeah, why don't we go up to the? We've already done that. The, all the discussion that was a great discussion, uh, by the way, and um, and the, the, that was pretty much what we were we had in the next few slides. Why don't we go down to the slide with the contact information uh but basically so it's, you might next 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 right yeah i mean so i mean that's our contact information there for the study that's our email so brave at phr.ca and that's the number uh that you can call if you're interested happy to chat with um, uh, patients directly and discuss this, this study and how uh, we think it, it may be able to to help and achieve their weight loss goals and and again um, what happens if you decide to participate first you will be going you would go to the Beatrice Clinic at St Joseph's Hospital and and they would uh, patients would have essentially an assessment to see if bariatric surgery uh, is they're eligible to receive the surgery so they go through a series of evaluations and meet with several experts um, and if that is the case then they will go through that step that randomization step or coin flip in which there's a 50 percent chance of having the surgery 50 percent chance of going through medical therapy uh, management so that with the team approach that we discussed and then we'll just see individuals uh, from time to time in the in the clinic just to follow how they're doing, see if they're feeling better, how their quality of life is. We'll also be counting things like strokes, heart attacks, um, and uh, and in the end compare both uh, both arms of the trial to see which one was better. And we'll also be looking at safety and things like that as well. So that's that's how. Um, uh, patients can connect and of course you know we also value uh, a strong relationship with the you know the patient's cardiologists and uh, and uh, and hopeful if there's patients in your practice Greg that want to be involved that uh, that you be involved in their care as well um, next slide please so I think this is a wonderful opportunity with this project tells me and first of all it's open to is it six people across campus? What's that, Greg? How many patients are you about to recall? Yeah, so we, go ahead, Ari. So I was going to say, we're looking for, um, in the pilot uh, study that's going to run for the first little bit, we're looking for 60 patients in Ontario uh, between our site and uh, sites that we're discussing right now and trying to get in uh, from the Ontario Bariatric Network. So. Uh, we're looking at uh, recruiting some other sites and trying to get around 60 patients for the first pilot just to ensure feasibility, safety, and make sure that, uh, uh, you know, everything's running smoothly before we're able to kind of expand it to other sites, not only in Canada, but perhaps in the United States as well. So to me, this is a wonderful um, opportunity for people who have cardiovascular disease, who have a body mass of 35, who are willing to put in hard work, who, if, if you're randomized to best medical therapy, you can't get best medical therapy anywhere else in this. This is the best medical therapy possible to humankind. If you're randomized to surgery, you get the top surgery possible for this, and you get all the supports either way. Um, I can't think of a better project to be involved if you're overweight and you need to make the next step. But I also know it's a good thing to need discussion. So, if you want to discuss things with uh, 
George and Ari and their team. I'm glad we're glad to talk to you and their team. If you want to discuss it with us, we'd be happy to give you our opinion too as well. Uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity. It's provided me lots of learning. Um, the Kenyan guidelines on obesity have come up, and uh, and, um, and and to me is that. Each component is important, but the, the most success we've seen right now by far is with surgery. And you have to decide if you're ready for that, if that meets your, what you want to do. Uh, there, there's um, good medical therapy, and this is that, uh, because the problem I see most of the time is that people come in defeated with their weight. Um, they feel they're stuck at that point in life. Um, my feeling is there's always opportunity to get better to improve. And just do something for 30 days uh, and, and keep learning, keep getting better. We have better drugs. We have better surgery. Uh, we have better supports. <laughs> but you need to be the captain of your, of your, of your weight and your, and your risk factors. Uh, if you're waiting for other people to solve your problem, I don't think you're going to solve the problem. But if you want resources to help you get better, there's a lot more opportunity ever before. So to me, this is at a crossroads. It's an exciting time. We still have so much to learn. The largest trial before was called the SOS, Swedish Obesity Study, to me was, an, was, was a huge trial. It showed that surgery was very successful in medical therapy, but the problem was it wasn't randomized. It wasn't high-quality information. We need to know for sure and the only way to know for sure is to randomize and to give the best medical therapy and the best surgical therapy. So this is a, a very unique opportunity. Is this trial going to go, go beyond 60 patients? Don't know. But if this part is successful, the answer is probably will. So to me, this is an opportunity for people who are serious about their weight, want to take the next step forward. Um, I know it's a big step. It's a scary step. Um, I, I learned a lot tonight. I learned that um, that uh, surgery has changed. I also know that medical therapy has changed. So um, this is wonderful. And uh, now, my head sore. Everybody's head is sore. This is a long discussion. Uh, this is something people will have to look at a number of times. Have discussions. In fact, tomorrow, uh, George and Harry, we have a few patients that are supposed to be watching tonight that we're talking to about tomorrow. Um, and so. Um, I, I, I think we can fill this trial up very quickly because it's an important trial and it's a well done trial. And uh, so I want to congratulate you both for putting this work together, coming out and sharing your insights and your knowledge. Um, I'm sure we'll have lots more questions. And uh, thank you very, very much for taking the time to, uh, to teach us and to make us better. Um, uh, no problem. I guess. It's our pleasure. Yes, thank you, Greg. And thank you for having us as yeah, well. Thank you. Now, like always, Stuart, you get the and, – and so if people want to communicate with us, those are some of my numbers there, and um, we're, we're working hard. Everybody's working hard. Stuart, are there any comments from anybody on uh, YouTube or any, anybody else? Everybody's just stunned right now. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, no comments today. I think everybody was kind of just soaking it in. Um, so no comments uh, on YouTube, no comments on WebEx. Now, do you have a, Stuart, you get the last word. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, I just wanted to thank Devanchi, uh, Stephanie, Emily, Zoya. It was a fantastic presentation, and uh, I really uh, appreciated them uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, control their slideshow. Um, I really learned a lot today, and um, I learned a lot about obesity. I learned a lot about managing your own health, uh, motivating yourself. Um, and I think my favorite part of the presentation today was, I think, at the end, uh, just watching uh, all the doctors interacting and asking questions. And uh, I know Dr. Kernu is a big, uh, uh, a big proponent that he really believes in. Is the only bad question that you uh, could ask is the one that you don't ask. And uh, and so I think you always just got to ask questions. I think that's a really nice takeaway: is that uh, you're not expected to know all the answers. You're not expected to know everything, and that's why you ask questions. That's why you. Uh, build support groups with other people, you communicate, you motivate one another. And so uh, this was a, a fantastic presentation today. Um, even though we didn't have too many questions at the end, um, I, I do think that uh, it really opened a lot of people's minds to the idea of uh, just communicating with one another, asking questions, uh, being curious about your own health and figuring out ways to, uh, to take control of it. So 
Uh, overall, it was a great presentation. I really enjoyed myself. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, we're going to make this available to as many people as possible. Uh, we're going to go through our database and, and try to contact people we think are good candidates because this is a good project. It's something needs to be done. And so thank everybody for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, we're going to have a little little, little power ourselves. So if people want to stay, they're very welcome to. Those who want to call it a night, that'd be great. In about 15 minutes from now, we're going to be going doing the Shadok stairs with uh, those that are still with us. Um, I see there's a couple of young ladies here with, with me still here in the clinic wearing our masks. We're going to take off our masks and go walk outside for a little bit. And uh, we'll be at the Shadok stairs in about 20 minutes. And uh, thank you all for participating. And um, thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.